So I think we're, we're just a, a couple getting a couple of minutes of a slow start on um, this morning. Um, but I'll get started when Mr. Weems pops up. We're going to start with introductions. I don't think he'll miss very much. I'm Reagan Smith, General Counsel of the Copyright Office, and this is our sixth day of hearing for our Section 1201 rulemaking. Um, today we are focused on Class 12, which concerns various adjustments or ex proposed expansions to exemptions um, for purposes of repair. Um, we're really excited to we have a big group today. Thank you for coming and we think we'll have a productive discussion. Um, so to go through logistics for those who might be new, um, my colleagues and I will moderate this session by posing specific questions. If you wish to respond, probably the easiest way is to use the Zoom raise hand button um, and we'll try to get through to people in term. If you're having issues, some people have been having issues, you can literally wave your hand or, or signal in the chat. For anyone in the audience or, or a panelist who has an issue um, uh, communicating in the chat or the Q&A, um, we'll alert someone at the Copyright Office to reach out to you to provide technical assistance. Um, for those who are uh, listening and watching as an SND, um, I guess this is the only session for today, um, but there is also a link in the chat if you wish to sign up for audience participation for tomorrow. Um, we are, um, that is a time for those who maybe didn't sign up for a specific panel, but wish to provide perhaps up to three minutes of their own views as to any of the proposed exemptions, and that will be concluding um, our hearings tomorrow. Um, and today's event is being recorded. The video will be posted to the Copyright Office website. I think it's also being live streamed. We have a court reporter transcribing the proceedings, so please try to speak slowly and clearly. I know we're all experts in, you know, virtual communication, so mute yourself if you're not speaking. Um, and uh, I think before we get started, I'd like to ask those um, from the government to introduce themselves. So um, maybe Mr. Amer, Mr. Bartelt, and Mr. Greenberg from the Copyright Office. Good morning, Kevin Amer, Deputy General Counsel. Good morning, Nick Bartelt, Attorney Advisor. Good morning, Brad Greenberg, Assistant General Counsel. Mr. Cheney, could you please introduce yourself? Sure, thank you and good morning. My name is Stacy Cheney. I'm a Senior Attorney Advisor in the Office of Chief Counsel at NTIA, Department of Commerce. So next part, we're just gonna do short introductions of, of where you are and what organization you may be representing. So I'm gonna try to go alphabetically, starting with those who have um, are here in support of the expanded exemption in some form or the other. So Ms. Burke. I'm Kathleen Burke and I'm representing Public Knowledge. Thank you, Ms. Gagliano. Cara Gagliano and I'm representing the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Mr. Einecker. Steve Einecker and I'm representing Trans State Equipment Company and Avanti Health Solutions in the medical segment. Mr. Kerwin. Uh, Robert Kerwin, uh, General Counsel to IMERS, the International Association of Medical Equipment Remarketers and Servicers. Mr. McCarg. Good morning, Mark McCarg. I'm a farmer in Central City, Nebraska, representing American Farm Bureau. Ms. Sheehan. Carrie Sheehan, I am the head of US policy at iFixit. Mr. Weems. Kyle Weems, and I am speaking on behalf of the Repair Association. Um, and now we'll have those who have filed um, in opposition to some or all of the proposed adjustments to the exemption. So, Mr. Ayers. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Michael Ayers, and I'm representing the Advanced Access Content System Licensing Administrator, LLC, usually referred to as AACSLA, and DVD CCA, uh, DVD Copy Control Association, usually referred to as DVD CCA. Thank you. Mr. Reed. Hi, my name is Morgan Reed. I'm the president of the App Association and the executive director of the Connected Health Initiative. Mr. Rosenbaum. Hi, I'm Kevin Rosenbaum, and I'm here today representing the Alliance for Automotive Innovation, 
auto innovators. Thank you, and Mr. Williams. Good morning, Matthew Williams, Mitchell Silberberg and Nup representing the joint creators and copyright owner. Thank you. Um, so we, we have a lot of people here on kind of a bigger record um, for, for this proposed class. So I wanna give a short roadmap of some of the issues, the, the order in which we are hoping to get through some of the issues to make sure we have time to get to it all. Um, so first we are going to address um, questions of the proposed scope of the, the class, whether it should be one exemption or multiple exemptions, which it currently is. Secondly, um, some of the proposals to make it device agnostic, as well as permit modification of devices. Um, next, um, issues specific to um, DVD or Blu-ray players, as well as video game consoles. Um, we have a couple of questions um, specific to causation, um, uh, then turning to medical devices, and then finally issues related to vehicles. So um, we'll try to get to everything and certainly some issues might be cross cutting, but I thought that might be helpful. So um, I guess to begin, it would be helpful to hear either from proponents or opponents um, with respect to some of the proposals by EFS or iFixit Repair Association to sort of broaden and condense the two existing regulatory exemptions into a single one that is agnostic as to device. So, so we have some precedent for this in an exemption for security research where the office concluded that computer programs can consist of constitute a proper class because the use was so tailored. Is that helpful for us to look at that in connection with the repair? Or are there different issues going on that we should be cognizant of with respect to the, the area that issue in this exemption. So I saw Ms. Sheehan first, please go ahead. Uh, so I think that's a great analogy. I think similar to how we think about security research, uh, when we're talking about repair, the purpose of the use is consistently non-infringing and the, the use of the software is, is virtually identical. The, func it, the purpose of repair is to restore the device to functionality uh, and you know, all of all of that is that's a fair use and it's not infringing uh, also under 117. Uh, continuing with the office's path of limited uh, exemption categories that are kind of device restricted or uh, limited to certain narrow categories of devices uh, really makes it difficult for these exemptions to keep up with the increasing number of software enabled devices with technological protection measures. So from a purely practical level, um, if we continue along this route, what, we're going to be us, uh, I fix it, the repair association, EFF, <laughs> and other individual users and organizations and advocates are going to be coming back every three years with a new roster of devices as the world of software enabled devices continues to explode. And uh, part of the problem that we see with some of these narrow categories is that, you know, sometimes it's unclear whether a device fits in one category or another. Is a headphone a wearable? Is it something else? What about a smartwatch? <laughs> uh, so the categories don't kind of keep up with market realities or how products are marketed or you know how how many functions they have and we just have a prolifer proliferation of these devices so you know three years ago we weren't really looking at a, a bunch of smart light bulbs but now we are uh, and and that's just going to increase going forward and i'll say that you know similarly to the exemption for encryption research and security research um when we when we're talking about you know looking at this broad category of devices for each of these devices the purpose is still non-infringing and the copyright analysis is the same the purpose is repair repair is non-infringing and that doesn't that doesn't differ between you know whether it's a phone or a tractor or um, a light bulb or a smart litter box thank you so um I'll call on you next, Mr. Gag Ms. Gagliano, but um, one thing to pick out, I saw Ms. Sheehan is stressing the, the purpose being shared, but I wonder if you could also address whether there is a similar causation effect. So do the TPMs work in the same way? And another you know, element, of course, we're considering is the effect on the market for copyrighted works and whether or not there's sufficient commonalities to assume they're all going to have a similar effect. Yeah, thank you. So, you know, I agree with everything that Ms. Sheehan just said, and to some of your points would add that, yes, I 
think that the uh, causation issues are very much the same and the effect on the market. And part of that is because like, so like security research and that exemption, we're already limited to a subcategory of literary works and have this specific purpose. But not only that, we're limited further, it's not all computer programs, it's just firmware. So embedded software that's controlling the operation of physical devices. And that unifying feature is what really unites the entire class in terms of common issues with all of the statutory factors, including market effects, because the thing about firmware that's unique relative to a lot of other kinds of computer programs is that there really isn't a separate market for firmware outside of the physical devices it's attached to that is just inherent to the nature of firmware. It's what makes it firmware is it is attached to sold with a specific device and any kind of modified firmware repaired firmware that's being produced through this exemption isn't something that is going to act as a market substitute for firmware because you would still have to buy the physical device or otherwise acquire the physical device in the first place with that firmware original firmware already on it so the copyright owner has already been compensated they they aren't selling any fewer copies of the firmware because the number of firmware copies is inherently tied to the number of devices sold and modified firmware is useless without that let me ask you one one question then i think i'll move on to make sure everyone has an opportunity to weigh in you're you're using this word firmware and the two exemptions now discuss computer programs that are contained in and control the functioning of a uh, lawfully acquired law right with lobbying what's in dispute do you think that contained in and control the functioning is that synonymous with firmware or are you are you sort of narrowing the description a bit more um i think it is essentially an, uh, synonymous um you know to the extent that the definition you mentioned contained in and controlling the operation of could be understood to be broader uh you know, that's really not what we mean. We're not talking about like apps, even if you could think in some sense, well, an app in some way controls the operation of the product, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about what, you know, is the industry term of firmware or embedded software. Okay, so it sounds like you might not object to an effort to sort of clarify that to the extent, you know, that might put Mr. Reed, for example, at the App Association, um, give him a little bit more comfort. Is that right? Sure. Okay. Um, so I think to, to keep going in order, we'll go to Mr. Weens and Mr. Williams. But Mr. Weens, I want to I want to press and give you the same question I asked Ms. Gagliano, because I still think um, one area to, you know, take the analogy to other exemptions is we similarly concluded in the unlocking class that there just weren't other examples of devices that needed to be unlocked. There were not TPMs effectively controlling access. And so that is the question we have here, whether there is the same, um, you know, showing of causation or adverse effects um, across these categories, because if there's not TPMs, it doesn't make sense to have a regulatory proceeding and, and sort of you know, make it seem like an exemption is needed as one is not, for example. And we also want to see whether there's, you know, other alternatives, even where there may be CPM. So can you provide a little bit more color about the other um, types of devices you think are not um, being able to be accessed, um, notwithstanding the current exemption? Absolutely. A uh, great question. Uh, what, what I think is interesting about this is, it, you know, we're talking about all of these devices, all kinds of different devices. What's sort of amusing to me technically about this is that the 
uh, the software, the, the work that we're talking about is substantially precisely the same in all of these cases, even though they're different devices. It's Linux. Linux is the work that is being protected in almost all of these cases, whether it is a nanny cam or a smart toaster or a industrial SCADA system, they are running on Linux. Um, and I like to call the Internet of Things uh, the Internet of Outdated Linux Distributions. Uh, and and what, what's happening is you hear about all of the, the kind of security problems that we have with, with Internet of Things. It's because these devices are, are outdated and, and, and not patched. And in response to all of the security vulnerabilities that have been found, manufacturers are, are, are locking these devices down. Um, it, it's interesting that like traditionally the copyright office is focused on TPMs where you have, you have a DVD of copy uh, protection put on the DVD. The copy protection is there to, to protect uh, the work from being copied. In this case, it's generally there to prevent malware. Um, and so are there TPMs on all of these devices? There should be. If a manufacturer is doing their job, what if it's if it's a nanny cam, you don't want that stream ending up on the public internet. You want it locked down. Uh, if it's a building automation system, uh, you don't want anyone on the internet to be able to log in and unlock the doors. You need to lock it. So I would say the the default case is, uh, yeah, there are locks. Uh, the, the locks are not intended to prevent the owner from accessing and modifying and unlocking a door in a building automation system. The locks are there to prevent, uh, to prevent uh, unauthorized third parties. Um, so if, if you you look at so the world of internet connected devices going forward. Uh, if I was designing them all, if I had to the my druthers, uh, I would put locks on all of them. <laughs> uh, and I think that you will see sort of the security best practices that, that there should and will continue to be locks on these devices. Is there an issue, for example, with the SCADA systems of not being able to repair them or even lawfully modify them because there's an inability to get permission. I mean, we had a specific record on that, for example, with the security research classes that there was a need um, to have good faith security researchers on those types of systems. And I don't know if we have a similar record um, in this class of, of the effect of 1201 on non-infringing uses for some of these types of devices. Uh, yeah, we uh, so one one story that we mentioned on the record was a um, a school. This is, I think, an elementary school, and the uh, the facilities maintenance uh, uh, person um, passed away, and he had the password to the whole system. Uh, and it, it turned out that this particular system, there was no way to uh, reset that password. What you had to do was wipe out the programming for the entire system and reprogram it, which if, like, so I've configured uh, some of these, these building systems and uh, like uh, when, you know, for our office, it took like a month of programming to set it up. It controls the lawn sprinklers. It controls timing on the doors who can go in and out. There's different timing settings if someone unlocks the door at 3 a.m., different security settings to go off and otherwise. It controls the air conditioning. Uh, in, in a larger, like in a school, it might control a water treatment system. Um, so it is a huge amount of work. So in that case where you need to be able to basically break into your own system to change the password, um, that would, uh, if they couldn't do that, you're, you're talking about like probably not the kind of repair that could happen in a weekend that might take a professional or someone really good at this a week to go in and, and reprogram everything. So, so the ability to uh, circumvent that would be very important. Uh, Another example that's personal to me, we have a building automation system that only supports 99 key cards and we have more than 99 people. <laughs> we need to change it. Do you know why it only supports 99 key cards? Is that part of a license? No, it's, there's no way to pay more. Uh, the company just doesn't support it. I think it was an artificial limit put in by some software engineer. I want to find that person and smack them upside the head because uh, it's very frustrating. <laughs> but uh, it's just, it's a limit. And I've asked, there's no amount of money that we can pay to change it. And um, another thing that I would mention, because we're talking about sort of third parties, you, know, you sort of have the branded folks, the folks who maybe have been trained by manufacturers to come in and, and, and do some of this work. Um, uh, we've had extensive experience with a lot of these folks and have had repair problems with our building automation system that the trained uh, service technician from the factory uh, can't figure out. They've been out a dozen times and can't figure out problems. And just to make sure I, I run down your example that you provided at the school, you can't call someone and say, you know, the guy who had the password is left. Can you reset it? Because I think that's, you know, something we find ourselves having to do with a variety of technology now. 
Uh, right. In this case, the system just wasn't designed that way. Uh, and I think that you will find that is fairly common. A lot of these, I mean, particularly we're kind of in the early days of all of these technologies. A lot of them are relatively primitive. And so in this case, the software just didn't have that feature. And so the, the, the factory technician is going to come out and say, your option is to wipe all the settings or cough up the password. Okay, thank you. So I, I know you talked for a little bit, Mr. Williams, you've had your hand up for a while. So, um, you know, please feel free to comment on, on the past speakers or the issues I suppose. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, I mean, I'm glad to hear Mr. Weems acknowledge that the use of locks is, is a best practice really with devices across industries um, and is not something to be critical of uh, in the abstract. And I think your question goes to whether all devices are the same or there are distinctions. And I think the records over the past few cycles have demonstrated that there are distinctions and you put your finger on a few of them with your questioning. Uh, for video game consoles, for example, there's a, a established consistent record that those uh, TPMs are in place to protect security of the devices, privacy of users, uh, prevent cheating, but also primarily and importantly to prevent infringement. And that the value of the device firmware is decreased by circumvention of these access controls, which impacts the fair use analysis and also the 1201 factors analysis. In addition, you've determine their alternatives to circumvention in certain respects with respect to repairing video game consoles. And that's not consistent across all of the devices that you've looked at here. And I think Mr. Weems examples just show you the wide variety of questions that can come up when you go from one device to the other device or to a system. Uh, your question was quite good about, is that a license? Could you pay more for 200 users instead of 99 users? The answer may be very different for different situations. And so just focusing on the video game console space, uh, I don't think there's anything in the record to deviate from prior decisions. Uh, and I think you've been wise to go at least device by device in terms of categories. I mean, you haven't been you know, myopically focused on individual devices but you have acknowledged that there are distinctions between categories of devices and those distinctions can have a lot of import, whether it's under 117 or 107 or alternatives to circumvention. And so I think that's been the right approach. Um, and I don't see it as analogous to security research. In part, I feel the security research ex exemption has been granted because there's a statutory provision that that you were building off of, and you felt that over time that provision was no longer doing its job. Uh, you know, whether I agree with that or not, I think that's how that progressed in the way it did. Uh, and I think this is a distinct situation. Okay, can I stand you with, with two, you know, follow up questions that are rather pointed and then get to everyone? So, it, did it? Why or why not um, was it helpful to hear um, suggestions that the proposed um, exemption is limited to, you know, so-called firmware or something Linux specifically? Does that help address your concerns at all or not? And if not, why? Uh, no, I don't think limiting it to uh, circumventing access controls on firmware would fix our concerns, especially in the video game console space. Um, when you circumvent those access controls, you undermine the security scheme that's in place to do a lot of different jobs, but importantly, protect the copyright integrity of the system. And so uh, that would not fix our concern there. Perhaps if you're in another space, uh, printers or you know uh, litter boxes, maybe the firmware doesn't have any other copyright purpose, but I think you've been right to acknowledge in the past that in video game consoles, it does. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Rosenbaum. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I know we're going to get to vehicles uh, in a different segment, but um, I just wanted to, uh, you know, make the point, uh, sort of following on Matt's point, that there are, uh, you know, distinctions, particularly with the automobile industry. My comments are address uh, only that industry. I, I don't have any. We don't have any position on any other devices here. Uh, but just uh, for example. Um, you know, there's no evidence that users of, of automobiles are having any difficulty getting their, uh, getting their automobiles repaired. Uh, there's a thriving aftermarket uh, going on. 70% uh, of post-warranty repair work is done by independent repair shops. Um, there's, of course, the MOU uh, under which uh, auto manufacturers are required to provide uh, uh, auto, auto, automobile owners and independent repair shops with the same repair and diagnostic information and tools, uh, you know, that are uh, provided to, to franchise dealers. Um, and then of course, the other uh, distinction uh, is the auto industry is very highly regulated. Uh, and there are, uh, uh, you know, the, the access controls, um, you know, also uh, protect software that uh, relates to safety and environmental uh, uh, regulations. Uh, and those are critical, which the office recognized in its implementation, in, in its uh, promulgation of the existing exemption. Um, and so, uh, you know, what's at issue here is relaxing um, some of these important uh, 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 restrictions on the existing exemption. So I just wanted to point out that, um, you know, there are some, some real distinctions here with the auto industry. Um. Thank you. And I, I see we have a lot of hands raised. So I'm going to keep keep moving on. So I think Mr. Ayers, I will go to you next. One question I'm wondering, and maybe part of what you're already prepared to comment upon is um, piggybacking off um, Mr. Rosenbaum bringing vehicles into this, the current exemption for vehicle repair accepts um, CPMs protecting works that are accessed on a subscription service, such as radio sort of expressible content. And that, that's an approach the office has taken to some exemptions, including also saying that circumvention, for example, in the jailbreaking context of audio speakers cannot be accomplished for the purpose of gaining access to other copyrighted works. And so I think he hearing, sort of anticipating who what you might be saying and also listening to what Mr. Williams said, is that an approach that is useful for the office to consider to sort of carve out um, the video game consoles or, um, DVD or Blu-ray players or things where the TPM's um, circumvention, is, if their record shows it will be more likely to have an adverse effect on the unlawful distribution of copyrighted works and perhaps, you know, the nanny cam. Um, Thank you. Uh, well, uh, certainly uh, to the extent there's an inclination to uh, grant the requested expansions to the exception or to exemption, uh, it's better to have limits than, than no limits. And uh, the concern of my clients is uh, geared towards those devices with optical disk drives that, uh, that play back expressive content like DVDs and Blu-rays, so including uh, game consoles. Um, so certainly if uh, we are uh, we still make, continue to maintain our position, but to the extent that there's an in, uh, inclination to go that way, uh, uh, carving out those devices uh, certainly relieves the pressure uh, to a certain extent on, uh, on my clients. And I would just note that a couple of other issues that have come up in, in the comments we've talked about uh, that we've had today. Uh, one is, well, we keep calling this a repair exemption a number of the examples uh, in the conversation today and in the comments received so far have actually gone well beyond repair and have included modification uh, of devices beyond their original functionality. Uh, and one of the concerns that uh, that uh, we would have would be the extent to which a, uh, a, a repair uh, is then geared towards changing the functionality of a device which uh, uses uh, AACS or, or CSS to, uh, to circumvent those technologies and uh, present pirated content uh, in a manner which, uh, in which it's, it's not authorized. Um, I would also note that uh, to, there was also the comment I thought was a very, a very uh, uh, salient one that uh, uh, locks are not always bad, uh, as has already been said, and that certainly uh, to a large extent, uh, the, the protections on firmware and devices are often to protect the users against the users of those devices uh, against uh, intrusions by uh, malicious third parties, and and that's certainly a good thing. 
Uh, but also to, to piggyback a little bit on other comments that have been made, there are other purposes for the firmware. And so there are, uh, for instance, in the context of uh, uh, DVD and Blu-ray, the firmware is used to uh, protect the decryption uh, uh, cryptographic values and device keys and certificates that are used to uh, render the device a, a, uh, a good citizen in the uh, 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 entertainment content world. Uh, making sure that it's a secure platform uh, that's available for a uh, content owner to release high value content in that format. And to the extent that um, the ability of the, uh, of the device to protect those cryptographic values is, uh, is uh, uh, rendered less, uh, is rendered uh, uh, less effective, uh, it reduces the attractiveness of the formats to content owners. Okay, thank you, Mr. Ayers. So I'm going to try to get through everyone who hasn't spoken um, yet, but then go back to you, Ms. Yan and Ms. Gagliano. I, I understand this probably that you wish to respond to. So, Ms. Burke, um, I, can we um, piggyback on what Mr. Ayers brought up, which is modification? And, and what are your thoughts? Um, you can comment on what, uh, some, what some of the prior commenters have said, but with respect to video game consoles in particular, do you see a need for modifications. I'm not sure I, I, that was the, I'm not sure if that's part of what public knowledge is, is supporting with respect to video game consoles um, for this exemption. Yeah, so with respect to modification, to the extent that you might need to modify the software in order to like repair or relock the optical drive once it comes, like once you change it out, I think that modification would be potentially necessary depending on what the anti-circumvention technology ends up doing. I know like um, as an analogy, there are some times when you might need to reprogram like um, in, a, in like the software, like how, what the function of a button is. Um, and so that might require modification, but in terms of like modification for a functional purpose, not modification to allow you to play pirated DVDs. And um, I just want to address that concern there that somehow allowing these, um, you know, changing out the optical drive and being able to repair that optical drive is going to jeopardize the security of the whole system. The lock that pairs an optical drive to the motherboard exists on the um, daughter board connection between the two devices. And it's my understanding that unlocking that so that you can pair a new optical drive is not going to then jeopardize the whole ecosystem of the video game console and its security protocols. Um, so I think that that's something that's particularly relevant here since this idea that all of a sudden changing out an optical drive is going to make it easier to pirate content, it just doesn't um, seem like that works within the realities of how these systems are constructed. Thank you, Mr. Reed. Hopefully your cat is uh, you know, out of the way. I think there are a couple of things. I want to actually note, um, I agree with um, Kyle Weens. I thought his uh, use of the concept of um, unpatched Linux is great. And I just think about the grub bootloader and the problems we've got there. But it actually points to the problem, Reagan, that you hit on exactly, which is any tools that you build to um, go against the TPMs um, open up a case for infringement that's pretty significant. You asked a great question, which is if that house software or that building software um, uses as part of its marketing, pay this much for 99 users, pay this much for 200. In Mr. Ween's example, there wasn't that option, but um, the tools have to be created in a way that would make access to it. All of the software that my members are making now, we're doing a lot of products that are essentially by the SIP right? You, you right size your product, you right size the price of your product. If the TPMs can be violated and tools are widely available that allow that to be um, broken through, then of course the other modifications that can be made are, well, I don't want to pay for 200 licenses. I'll buy one for one license and I'll use TPM breaking tools to increase that number to 99. Our entire app ecosystem business model essentially exists on these concepts of of a uh, right sizing, an in-app purchase, a purchase that you make to get exactly what you want and not pay more for it. The TPMs that are being, uh, that are in place, as he noted, um, for safety and security, also secure the framework that allow for 
the appropriate um, licensing and right sizing of the products. I think the one other comment that goes along with it, though, on the comment we just heard about the daughter board and where the technology exists is valid, but at its core, she's essentially saying, hey, guys, you need to rewrite your software. If you're not doing it this way, then you as an industry need to change the way you behave. And I don't think that meets the test that the Copyright Office is setting. Those of us who are writing the products should not be forced to modify our software to meet this change that they want. So the fact that in some cases the uh, the connection is on the daughter board or on the on the physical device um, may be something that software refers to when checking other things. So the request here is not just we'd like to hack it ourselves. Her point was, well, you can make this real easy change to your software, and if you do that, then there won't be a problem. That's a bar that the Copyright Office shouldn't be making, shouldn't be telling us to change our software in order to accommodate someone else's ability to break into it. Can I ask you while I have you, so the the way we've structured the current uh, uh, vehicle exemption does not extend to TPMs protecting subscription services, and you could see sort of a similar description of Yep, you know, exceeding terms of use and some of the issues you're talking to. Is that a helpful way we can think about these Internet of Things, um, you know, software embedded devices or or is there a technological reason to to suspect that enabling repair to the original right. estate is a great question. Somehow... Yeah. Yeah. So I'll, I'll give an example. One of the problems that we're running into right now is um, and this gets into TPMs is uh, we can't actually um, avoid piracy by giving our products away for free. So to your question about can you isolate it into these camps because, well, uh, a TPM that's strictly for this use um, is bad. We're actually seeing a situation right now where uh, software is developed and distributed for free, ad supported, where the TPMs are being broken and then that software is being hijacked and an additional ad network is placed underneath it. So literally, I give my software away for free, and it is being pirated, and an additional ad network is being installed underneath it. So your point about, well, can we isolate it into a, a copyright infringing use? Uh, that's an example that violates my copyright, but it's not one that has to do with how much I'm charging or where I'm doing it. I'm literally giving my software away for free, and people are still going to break it and use it in a way that, um, that disadvantages me. So. Uh, I think to your point, I think that obviously what you've done so far has worked, but I would be very concerned about any expansion of that across multiple sectors, because I think it's hard to keep that from breaking into um, uh, harmful uses. Okay, um, thank you, Mr. Reed. So, Ms. Gagliano, um, I, I think you've had your hand up for a while, so whatever, uh, excuse me? Okay, thank you. Um, if you would like to comment on uh, what you had your hand raised for, as well as, you know, in particular how the office can think about modification as an unlawful use, uh, as a lawful use across these devices, and maybe address um, some of the comments raised about distinguishing between lawful modification on the one hand and the derivative right on the other. Yeah, so I think in, in particular responding to uh, you know what we've been hearing a lot of from opponents about how look if you let people get past these TPMs they're going to infringe infringement is going to happen even if that means having to bypass another TPM which the exemption would not permit uh, you know even if that means having to go another step and do the exemption for purposes that the TPM does not permit, you know, I, I don't think it is appropriate for the office to consider in deciding, you know, is this an appropriate exemption to consider whether people will then break the law and actually go beyond the scope of that exemption. I mean, you, you could have said the exact same thing about the security research exemption, and I think any of opponents did. The security research exemption applies even to video game consoles, to DVD and Blu-ray players. We haven't heard anything from opponents about increased infringement uh, since 2018 attributable to granting that exemption. 
So when people are using these exemptions, it is to do the not make the non-infringing uses that were being adversely affected. And the fact that someone might go further and try to say, well, this exemption protected part of what I did isn't really relevant. It's still assuming that someone is going to violate 1201 either way. Um, you know, and in terms of the concern that someone would, you know, that a possible modification of the firmware would be to make the device changed in a way that would enable piracy. You know, one, one simple tweak to our language that would get maybe more at what we actually had in mind is, you know, saying for it would be circumvention not only for purpose of non-infringing modification, in which case we mean the actual creation of the modification would be non-infringing, but it could also be for a non-infringing purpose. So the exemption doesn't have to cover modifications that would be for the purpose of you know, enabling piracy, getting access to uh, you know, other copyrighted works. But either way, the exemption is not giving anyone permission to circumvent TPMs on any work other than software. It's not giving permission to circumvent TPMs for the purpose of infringement. Uh, and you know we have heard the same argument in every rulemaking cycle uh, against many of the exemptions that have already been granted, like all the jailbreaking exemptions, uh, the past exemptions for vehicles, last year's the exemption for repair of certain consumer devices and home appliances. Every time opponents say, this is gonna make everyone infringe, there's still absolutely no evidence of that. And I think the absence of that evidence okay. is a form of evidence itself. Thank you. I'm gonna to try to, to just keep our, our comments a little bit shorter if we can going forward to make sure we have time to get through everything. Ms. Sheehan, did you wanna to speak to the, the question of lawful modification? I know the office has had some hesitancy in, in the past to conclude that that's the right defining um, you know phrase for that with level of specificity. It would be welcome your thoughts. Absolutely. Do you mind if I also address a couple of your earlier questions? Um, so I'll start with your first question about uh, the, the causation issue. So the, your question about whether there are TPMs in every software enabled device uh, and to the extent that those obstruct repair. And I would say that uh, if there's not a TPM in a device, it's not part of this conversation about the exemption. So the exemption, the scope of the exemption is only to uh, is only for circumvention of TPMs that exist in a software enabled device and that obstruct repair, right? So um, the fact that, that some devices might not have TPMs, the fact that those devices exist, doesn't obviate the need for circumvention where TPMs do obstruct repair. So first question. <laughs> Second, I'd like to address what some of the other panelists have talked about in terms of devices that uh, play back AV or expressive content. Uh, and I'll say that this, as, as Ms. Gagliano very correctly uh, identified, that this the subject of this exemption is the software. It's the, the embedded software in the device. It is the firmware. It is not the copy controls on the content, and it is not the um, TPMs that that protect the, that content from infringement. Um, furthermore, repair of devices that play lawfully acquired copies of expressive content increases the accessibility both of to both the functionality of the software and the lawful performance of those lawfully acquired works. And the only purpose for, for the circumvention that is acknowledged and permitted within the exemption is for repair. So it's an exemption like this would, would as Ms. Burke, as Ms. Gagliano said, would not um, authorize circumvention for the purposes of piracy, so on and so forth. Um, and I think that the office itself has acknowledged that in the 2018 recommendation when it addressed uh, expressive content on vehicle inf infotainment and telematics systems and said that those the concerns about piracy in those contexts related primarily to abuses of circumvention that are outside the scope of the proposed exemption. And I would say that's true here as well. Um, in terms of alternatives, um, Mr. Williams raised the specter of alternatives to circumvention. And I'll say that um, the, the 
the existence of alternatives to circumvention is not fatal to prior exemptions and shouldn't be fatal here. Uh, the office granted the motorized land vehicle exemption uh, with that, despite the existence of other alternatives. And we know that those alternatives often prove inadequate. That's fully documented in our record. But I'll also say that in Chamberlain, the Federal Circuit decided that 12, Section 1201 did not grant copyright holders uh, another exclusive right. It only protected the exclusive rights that they already had under 106. And so the Section 1201 does not give copyright holders the right to control the market for repair services and the right to require that you use their own branded repair services. To, to, to deny an exemption on the basis of the existence of those manufacturer branded alternatives would be to grant a new right, would be a grant a new right to exercise anti-competitive practices uh, and control uh, uh, an entire market. Um, moving on to the question of- Can, can I ask you just to sum that one, to yeah. sum that one point before we get to modifications, do you think it's relevant whether there's an additional charge or terms or something connected to repair or whether it's sort of open in terms of the purchase or the initial license? Um, I don't understand your question. Do you mind rephrasing? Well, I guess you've said um, you've expressed concern about a branded repair market. And I guess we're looking at this through the 1201 lens of whether there's an adverse effect created by CPM. So do you think it's relevant whether there's conditions opposed upon the manufacturer provided repair or absolutely. or it doesn't matter. No, absolutely. And I think that that goes to the kind of tangible practical adverse impact on users of software enabled devices. And that, you know, in our experience, uh, we talk to repair shops, we're pretty deep into the repair industry over at iFixit and the repair association. And our experience with manufacturer branded repair is that the types of repairs that they can carry out are limited. Uh, meaning, you know, if I take a certain device, if I take a tractor to the John Deere dealership, they can only do certain repairs. If I take my, um, my iPhone to an Apple authorized repair provider, Provider or an, or an Apple IRP provider, they can only do simple basic repairs before they either encourage me to buy a new device or have to send it back to Apple. Uh, some manufacturer branded services may be extremely costly or more expensive than an independent. I know in the medical device sector, it was found that manufacturer branded medical device repair could cost 30 to 50% more than an independent service organization's repair. Um, it can also involve long delays if you have to schedule or ship a product back to a manufacturer. Uh, and it can also, you know, some, to some some circumstances, you might not be able to get a repair at all. So Kyle mentioned earlier, our uh, kind of industrial or premises control systems. Um, if we are completely outside of a service network for our manufacturer on some of those systems. And so if we were to depend on manufacturer branded repair services, we would be completely out of luck. Um, okay, is there thank you. And then modification. modification. Me? Yeah, so I just wanted to say briefly, I think Ms. Gagliano addressed that pretty well, uh, extremely well. And I just say that that um, in Sega versus Accolade, the court found that, uh, soft, that modification of the software enabled device is not infringing, especially when it is a reasonable step to a transformative use such as repair. So when a modification is carried out for the purposes of repair or for other non-infringing uses, then it should also be understood as non-infringing. One, can I say one okay. thing? <laughs> just one more quick, I'll be quick, I promise. Extremely limited, because I do see a lot of hands raised. we've got to move on. Okay, I just wanted to respond really briefly to both Mr. Williams and Mr. Reed's comments about uh, the necessity of TPMs to prevent cheating, uh, to protect privacy, or to protect the you know safety and emissions. And I would say that absolutely none of those things are part of the, the Copyright Office's very copyright-based inquiry on whether a 1201 exemption should be granted. And I'd actually be interested to know whether the clients that Mr. Williams and Mr. Reed represent are actually using 1201 to go after people for cheating or violating emissions controls or violating a user's privacy, because I'm unaware of any cases like that. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. McCarg? Well, thank you. I, I just want to uh, remind people that I am a farmer. I'm not an attorney. So this is a very interesting conversation to me. Uh, you know, on, on our farm, one of the things that we're really concerned about, someone mentioned uh, the, the use of tools. And as our ag equipment gets uh, more complicated uh, every day, it seems like, there's an increasing need to uh, have users, or I'd say third party experts develop a tool that can work on my, my tractor. Uh, I know there's, there, there, there's difficulties in, in, our, in our area anyway, that the dealerships or the authorized dealerships 
uh, say they will provide tools, but they're really not uh, the tools to the extent that we can come in and actually uh, fix our equipment back to actually operating state. And so I just wanted to wanted to say that that was one of the things that we're concerned about in the ag sector. The other thing is there was conversation about modification and may not quite fit into this category, but uh, we're we are clear at American Farm Bureau that if there's modification that envir in, involves environmental or safety issues, I think we have to be very careful uh, when we start going, going down that route. Uh, if we're talking about things that we can improve potentially, but we have to be very careful when it gets into environmental and safety issues. Thank you. I, I appreciate um, your thoughts. Um, so I think the next person who has their hand raised is Mr. Ayers, but given our time, I'm also going to to shift some of the questioning to my colleague, Mr. Amar, so that we can, you know, wrap up modification discussions, but segue into some of the device specific categories of the media players or the video game console. So I don't know, Mr. Amar, if you wanted to, to pose any additional question, but I do think it is Mr. Ayer's, uh, you know, turn to respond. Yes, well, actually my first question was gonna be about uh, DVD players anyway. So uh, maybe Mr. Ayers, you could speak to this. So I. I wanted to sort of make sure I understand what seems to be kind of a factual dispute potentially about um, what the TPM's protecting firmware and DVD players uh, controls access to. So I know that the proponents have said that their proposed exemption would apply only to software that controls the operation of the device and would not permit circumvention of separate TPMs that protect access to uh, DRM protected media. Um, now you've talked today earlier on, you talked about, I think the cryptographic values that exist in DVD players could, and, and I think you said something about if those are altered that makes the device sort of less a, a less attractive uh, platform for uh, manufacturers, could you sort of elaborate and explain a little more clear, uh, explain sort of what these cryptographic values protect uh, and what they don't protect? Uh, sure, thank you. Um, so the the concept with content protection technology in, in consumer electronics devices uh, in the uh, entertainment content space is that the content owner uh, and the device manufacturer are both engaged in, a, in an ecosystem uh, where uh, the content owner is uh, sufficiently trustful, uh, uh, finds the, the, the target device sufficiently trustworthy that, it, uh, that the content owner will release its high value content in the format played by that device. Uh, in the context of uh, uh, movies on optical disc, that includes uh, authoring and manufacturing the, the movie and the disc with certain cryptographic values uh, that are used to encrypt the movie, uh, corresponding uh, uh, cryptographic values such as device keys are embedded in the device by the manufacturer during, uh, uh, during the manufacturing process that are then used to decrypt the content on those discs. So you put the disc in the machine, uh, the machine uh, has decryption keys that allow it to decrypt uh, the content on the disk that has been encrypted with the encryption keys. So uh, this provides uh, a benefit for consumers, uh, as has been mentioned in other uh, hearings, uh, DVD was one of the most uh, successful consumer electronics uh, uh, products in history, in the history of consumer uh, products. Uh, and, uh, and it certainly laid the, the groundwork for, for uh, commercial success for, uh, for uh, multiple industries since then. So, but to the extent that those devices become compromised um, and are no longer able to be trusted. Uh, it presents a problem for the content owners in investing uh, a ton of money in very high value content, such that it's no longer as good an investment because the uh, the content is less secure. And uh, uh, you know, and certainly, you know, uh, folks might uh, might look at well, they're movie studios; they have a lot of money anyway. Uh, and I think it's, you know, the idea here is, look, this, these are investments of, of, uh, of significant resources, uh, both on the device side and on the content side to make sure that this all works together. So that the end result is uh, an extremely attractive uh, proposition uh, for the consumer. 
And so to the extent that this is that this compromises it, we have less of a uh, of an attractive uh, setting. And and just a, a quick a quick follow up on, wait, on an wait, earlier wait. comment. Can I just can I just follow up sure. on that first though? So are you saying that if someone were to circumvent TPMs protecting the firmware on a DVD player, that would necessarily expose these cryptographic keys you're talking about, and it would therefore allow people to uh, you know play unauthorized DVDs. Uh, that's that's essentially the concern. I mean, uh, the exact way that each uh, device manufacturer implements uh, the storage of uh, of the, the the applicable cryptographic values is is somewhat flexible to allow for the realities of device manufacturing in different contexts. But that's the essential uh, concern. And it, and in that in that case, what you what you've done is uh, when the key is exposed, you're no longer looking at a onesie twosie uh situation where you 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 may be uh compromising a movie at a time which is itself not desirable at all but because it's a decryption key that could decrypt any dvd or any blu-ray disc it uh, uh potentially endangers the entire ecosystem because now you've enabled uh a, a circumvention tool for uh for the the, the high value entertainment content okay um miss burke uh could you uh respond to that yes um it's our understanding that the limited request that we've asked for which is the exemption to unlock an optical drive replace it and then relock that pairing um would not cause that kind of decryption of what protects the blu-rays and the dvds at question here um Rather, I think it's important to note that the, this TPM that locks and pairs an optical drive to the rest of the video game console is unique to these optical drive driven video game consoles. Other um, devices that have optical drives don't necessarily have these same locks. So if you wanted to replace your optical drive in your computer, you could go get a new optical drive, put it in your computer and you know plug it in and, and change it out pretty simply without having to circumvent this kind of TPM. So these optical drives, um, being able to change them out doesn't really implicate the, the same concerns when it comes to that type of a situation with being able to change out your optical drive. So what makes a video game console so unique? It's our understanding that these TPMs that are protecting the optical drive don't actually protect the content that could be played on an optical drive. Rather, it just protects this particular pairing. And so the, the TPMs that need to be circumvented here you know, they're really just protecting or preventing people from being able to repair an optical drive, which is, um, you know, a harm to consumers because optical drives are the most frequent thing to fail in a video game console. Replacing one is fairly cheap as opposed to having to purchase a whole new device. And so it's our understanding that these TPMs really aren't protecting content so much as they are preventing these types of repairs, which consumers have a right to do when you own a device you should be able to repair it. And copyright should not be a tool that prevents you from being able to do that. It's not intuitive and it doesn't make sense with regard to what copyright is intended to protect. Okay, thank you. Um, I think Mr. Cheney, do you have a question? Thank you, I think this has been a helpful discussion and I think it's been helpful for me to hear this a little bit on these um, game systems and DVD players. Um, for example, <clears throat> one of the questions I had with these crypto Cryptic, cryptographic values, sorry, um, that potentially are exposed um, or may be misused. Can you describe what that might be like in the sort of repair that has just been described? I think Mr. Ayers, you may have the best answer here. Are they allowed to be copied and reproduced? I mean, what is the, what is the possible path to um, piracy here if that is, if they are indeed exposed in this repair. Um, uh, is it on the device itself or is it something that would be a broader piracy possibility? Can you describe that a little bit more because I'm not sure I'm getting where that value gets exposed here. Can you help me out here? Thanks. Yes, thank you. So the, uh, it is in the, in the broader context that we're concerned uh, that we're most concerned about this. So when the device key, uh, we'll call it, is extracted, 
uh, is exposed and extracted from a particular device, that um, that key can then get be be incorporated into, for instance, a software uh, circumvention tool, and that is uh, essentially how uh, uh, various of the current uh, 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 unauthorized circumvention tools operate today. They use stolen keys that have been uh, taken out of uh, other otherwise legitimate products, uh, and then are incorporate those device keys are then incorporated into a, uh, a circumvention tool, usually a software product. Uh, that then we're now not talking about uh, one device being able to play back any movie that it wants to, which was already able to do because it had a, a device key in it in the first place, but it's now enabling uh, a whole market full of uh, circumvention tools in the form of uh, software uh, that provides a much bigger, a bigger avenue for, uh, for piracy than, uh, uh, than might have been possible with that single device. Thank you, Mr. Ayers. Does anyone else have some input on that particular question? And, and particularly, does this repair on those players expose those cryptographic keys? And that's, I understand potentially how it might get out there, but if that can help direct the question. Thanks. Mr. Reed, I think I see your hand if that's okay. Yeah, I, I'll just add this. So while everyone was talking, I just, I just put into my Google search engine, hack my Xbox drive. Here's the one that comes up first. Flash the light on disk drive used by some Xbox consoles for hacking. If you're tired of paying $60 for a new Xbox game or waiting years for them to get cheaper, you should probably mod your system. That's literally the first thing that comes up and it goes through and has a video of how you actually flash the drive uh, by installing a different, uh, a different DVD player into your, into your box and flash the drive to allow you to play um, discs that violate the copyright. So at the core of your question is, is this a vector by which people can use it? Well, literally that's the first thing that comes up on your Google search when you put in hack your, hack your Xbox drive. So uh, whether or not we can talk about which case law applies, um, the search engine bar will tell you how quickly and easily it's there and why that is a primary vector. So, you know, in this case, Google is your friend. Uh, find the answer, hack your, hack your drive, flash it and run disks that you wanna play for less than 60 bucks. It's right there. First output. Okay, um, so we have lots of hands up, so I'm going to try to get to everybody, um, and I would ask everybody to just be relatively brief. Uh, Mr. Weens, maybe uh, you could go next. Sure. Uh, I would encourage Mr. Reed to go ahead and give that site sixty dollars, and then they're going to sell your credit card number on the black net. It's a scam. There isn't a. There isn't such a hack. There are a lot of wonderful sites that will like trick you and make you think that they will help you hack your Xbox. And they'll happily take your credit card number and then not help you hack your Xbox. Uh, the Xbox One, the PlayStation 4, PlayStation 5 haven't been cracked. Uh, so it's, it's, that's a non-issue. Um, the I think that, that uh, if you think about this in the context of what you can do with a PC, a Blu-ray drive on a PC, we have the ability uh, to do the work um, on those. It's, it's not implicating, you know, creating any challenges. Um, the, the, you know, the, those, those encryption keys are, are on the drive. They're fine. That's not what we want to access. All we want to be able to do is restore the device back to, uh, uh, to functionality. And I would note that functionality, from, from my perspective, the device isn't repaired unless it, the copy protection is restored. Like we don't want to remove the copy protection. We want to get the device it working exactly as it did from the factory. So when, when these devices are provisioned in the factory, in the Xbox or the PlayStation factory, they take an off the shelf drive, put installed in the machine, they run a software tool that pairs that, that optical drive to the machine. That's all that we want to do is just, is just do that pairing. Uh, this is, you know, we, this, I think that this has gotten more complicated than it really is. We just want to fix the thing. Okay. Um, Mr. Inneker, I think you've been waiting. Thank you. Uh, similar to Mr. McCargue, I am not a lawyer, and I have found this uh, conversation very, very interesting. Um, but talk about Xboxes and DVDs and everything else uh, is very interesting, but we are all consumers of healthcare. Our businesses that we have within Avanti Health Solutions, we repair vital medical equipment and we do it as independent service organizations. And as all of us as consumers of healthcare, it should be of great value for you to understand that we do it much more responsibly, much more safely, and in many cases, much, much more cost effectively than the original equipment manufacturers do. Yet, 
They have put restrictions in place through these TPMs to prevent us from being able to service it. No different than your automobile, no different than your agriculture equipment. We need to have the right to repair the equipment for our customers and have access to do so on a readily available basis. This is a patient safety issue. When we can't get access to the equipment that we need to service, patients wait. When an MRI is down or a CT is down or a cath lab is down or, or a, a piece of diagnostic equipment is not working, patients have to wait and that harms their care. I just wanna- It's quite I, a I, issue for our industry. I, I appreciate it. I wanna stop you there because we're, uh, I, I wanted to ask about uh, DVDs and video game consoles, we're going to get to medical devices in just a little bit. So hold that thought, if you would. Um, let's go to uh, Mr. Williams. Uh, thank you very much. A uh, lot's been said, but I'll, I'll try to, to stay brief. Um, so the video game consoles, as Mr. Ayers mentioned, have some of the same concerns with respect to, to keys because they, they play discs with motion pictures on them, but they also have the concerns uh, that you've identified in previous proceedings related to either installing and playing uh, illegal copies of, of games uh, or, or using illegal discs. And um, I appreciate Mr. Reed's comments on that. Uh, you know, one difficulty from the comments that we have is that there's no, there's no real specifics about the uh, procedures that they say they can implement to, uh, to repair or uh, replace the optical drives. Um, they seem to lay out two scenarios. One is using an application of some sort to flash the device. Um, and one is a more manual procedure. Um, Going back to, I believe, all the way to 2012, the office has concluded that there has not been evidence that you cannot replace or repair an optical drive without circumvention. And so depending on the different approaches that they take, uh, there may be alternatives to, to circumvention here. Um, the other issue is uh, they say that they will restore all of the functionality of the TPMs but there's no explanation of exactly how that's going to happen either. Um, and my understanding is that uh, this is of concern to the console manufacturers, not only whether they can actually restore the functionality to its original state, but also that the, the use of an application to open up the system for the purpose of replacing or repairing the optical disk drive could lead to the use of unauthorized applications or disks. Um, just very quickly, uh, Ms. Sheehan asked about cases where the industries have pursued issues under 1201. I think you know there are quite a number, but in the video game space, you know, two of the biggest names are the MDY case and Davidson versus Jung. They go all the way to the appellate level. Um, and, and so 1201 has been enforced, including uh, in um, by the Department of Justice, and there's a case in our comments on that. Let me let me um, just jump in. The consumers here is not from the manufacturers. Really, could I uh, could I just jump in? Could I just jump in? I because I wanted to ask about something you said earlier. Um, because there does seem to be again this factual question about restoring the TPM. So I I believe it was public uh, knowledge's reply comments that said um, a video game console will only function if the two portions of the console unlock by repair of the motherboard and the optical drive are relocked. Um, is there any dispute about that? They seem to be saying that in order for, uh, you know, a repaired video game console, at least with respect to the optical drive to work at all going forward, you have to restore the TPMs. Do you have a any information on that? Uh, so to my understanding, uh, it may depend on what your definition of function is. Um, it, if you want to restore it to full functionality to where it is capable of interacting with the authentication servers, et cetera, um, that, that may be true. Um, without repairing those TPMs, whether you could still 
play offline, uh, you know, infringing games, I think is a different question. Um, if, if you gave me a post hearing letter on that, I could probably give you more specifics and it may be different from console to console, the exact answer, but that's my understanding. Okay. Um, Ms. Gagliano, I think you've been waiting. Yeah, I, I just wanted to respond to a point Mr. Ayers was making about the DVD and Blu-ray context, saying that, you know, even if the exemption itself doesn't permit piracy, you know, with, within its scope, that the movie studios, the content providers, just knowing that people are allowed to circumvent the TPM would and that that would make the system less secure, would be less willing uh, to you know, license their content for release on DVD and Blu-ray, which you know, is a little confusing to me because I think we all know DVD CCA and AACSLA even brought up in their opposition comments, DCSS, the still widely available program for decrypting DVDs. Uh, and since at least 2007, the encryption keys for Blu-ray encryption, uh, decryption keys for Blu-ray encryption have also been out there widely publicly available. You know, it may not be legal to distribute and use these, but it also would not be legal to, you know, be bypassing the content protection TPMs under the proposed exemption. And I have not seen or heard any evidence that since those keys have become publicly available uh, through various means that there actually has been any decrease in content providers' willingness to license their works for release on DVD and Blu-ray. So I, I just don't think that point really seems to hold up based on what we know from the real world. Um, Mr. Ayers, your response. Uh, thank you very much. And, and actually part of why I had my hand up was to address the earlier comment uh, that was made that there's no evidence of increased piracy. Uh, just I, I would note that specifically in the game console space, one of the most popular platforms uh, for the playback of uh, unauthorized content is uh, uh, an application that's a direct descendant of early efforts to hack and modify the Xbox console. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and similar to the, the, the Google search we were uh, uh, introduced to a little earlier in the conversation, uh, a similar search uh, regarding this product will, will, will yield the result that yes, uh, the distribution of the, of the uh, playback platform itself is uh, will make uh, uh, comments about uh, not pirating content. Uh, however, every single reference you find in association with that uh, platform in a Google search talks about getting free movies and TV. Uh, and so we see the you know the the technical compliance uh, effort versus the uh, the the real world in in that case. And and uh, to address the more recent comment uh, about what action has been taken, um, actually action has been taken. Uh, and while uh, certainly, my clients are are uh, not ones to seek the limelight and uh, uh, and and do perp walks, for instance. Uh, in cases like this, there are uh, there are certainly efforts that are taken. A, a successful content protection effort involves technical uh, uh, elements as well as legal elements, and my clients have pursued both uh, uh, in a number of cases. And so, uh, and then to look at the content industry as because it still continues to release Blu-rays as therefore it must not be a problem, I think is a, a gross oversimplification uh, of how the market works in this case and, uh, uh, and the, uh, the realities of uh, content distribution. Uh, Mr. Weens. Uh, I, I just wanted to make myself available if you have additional uh, technical questions on how the, like where the encryption keys are stored and, and how that works. Um, well, do you have a, a, any information that you could offer on this question of, uh, the need to, to relock video game consoles if you're repairing the optical drive? 
Yeah, the, the g- game console would not work to play off-the-shelf games unless you restore the TPM, unless you restore its ability to um, to, to have those keys and, and have that communication, right? Because if I buy Call of Duty, it's encrypted. Uh, so that's all we want to do is, is keep it in place. And I think that the point that these keys have, the, the Blu-ray uh, keys have already been leaked is poignant because we're talking about not allowing people to get in and, and access something. Well, that, that, that secret is already out there. All, all the the criminals are doing the criminal activity. What we're saying is we we just want to be able to do the, the, the legal activity. And I would say like the market harm here is real. I have a uh, entire shelf full of about a hundred uh, PS5 um, or PS4 optical drives and 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 main boards, and we have to sell those together. So I, I have to take a, a main board and an optical drive, sell it as an expensive part. We are completely supply constrained. The number of people out there that can fix their game consoles is completely limited to the number of game consoles that end up at recyclers. That, that then those two pieces together both work and we can get out there. So it's like there are maybe hundreds of people a quarter that can fix their own game consoles when in the market there are millions of people that potentially have these problems. So this is a a very real and and kind of dire problem. Every time I talk with a repair professional, I mention the game console thing. They just <laughs> they just get sad. Okay, thank you. Um, let's go to uh, Miss Sheehan and and Miss Burke quickly, and then uh, I think we'll move to another question. I just wanted to uh, endorse what Ms. Gagliano and Mr. Weens had said. On one side of the scale, it's a little bit late for hand wringing over access to decryption keys, as as Ms. Gagliano and Mr. Weens said. The horse is kind of out the barn door with that. They're widely available, and uh, and restricting people from being able to repair their consoles isn't going to re- protect them anymore. Uh, I think one thing to note to recognize there is that you know people who are going to infringe copyright deliberately or going to or who are going to hack their consoles in order to infringe French copyright are already doing that. They're not waiting for a 1201 repair exemption to be able to do that. Uh, the 1201, the lack of a, a repair exemption to 1201 only really impacts people who are interested in doing the lawful activity of repair. And in this case, we're talking about, you know, really just replacing an optical drive on a machine where the optical drive is broken and then re-enabling the TPM protection there. So we just, we just want to fix our consoles. And, you know, we talked to, as I mentioned before, we talked to repair shops all around the country and all around the world. And we talked to, to folks who specialize in video game repair. And they tell us that they have storage rooms full of hundreds of consoles that they've been unable to, to fix for, for their customers because without the ability to replace a broken optical drive on its own, the repairs are too costly, too risky, and the parts are too hard to find. Thank you, Ms. Burke. Yeah, I just wanted to echo what um, Ms. Sheehan and Ms. Wine, or Mr. Wines and Ms. Cagliona um, have said here today. That the what's what's interesting here is the the conversation that Mr. Reed had earlier about um, people pirating um, games, even that they had given away for free, and the the wide availability of these decryption keys. It kind of demonstrates that these these locks aren't preventing pirates from pirating. They're not, um, they're not preserving the, the copyright of, of these um, creative works. What they are actually doing is they are preventing law-abiding citizens who want to do law-abiding things such as repair their devices. And so I think like that's particularly relevant when looking at this exemption request, that what we're asking for is an exemption for a limited purpose to perform a repair. We are not asking for an exemption to um, pirate content. And the the underlying work that is being protected by this TPM, it isn't the movies on the Blu-rays um, or the DVDs or even on the video game discs. It's the, it's the software that the firmware that is controlling this lock itself. So I think that's also particularly relevant here when we're talking about like what copyright work is actually being protected here with this um, lock on the optical drive to the motherboard. So there's just this over the, the, the concerns about piracy here feel more like fear mongering as opposed to actual realities of um, what is at stake. Okay, so thank you. That that raises an an issue that I wanted to follow up on quickly and then I think we'll move to the next um, topic. And it's it's this idea of sort of the relevance of what the purpose of the circumvention is. Um, And I'm interested in 
particularly the opponent's response to this. So, I mean, you know, one argument that I think we've heard today from the proponents is that, um, you know, the existing temporary exemptions, for example, for security research and jailbreaking and, and, and also the permanent exemptions for things, you know, like security testing and encryption research, all refer to the purpose of the circumvention, right? Um, they, they turn on whether the circumvention is undertaken for uh, uh, an accepted purpose. Um, so, you know, certainly with the vehicle repair portion of this exemption, we've included language that, you know, it tries to state clearly that the circumvention may not be undertaken for the purpose of gaining access to, to other types of works. I wonder if that approach, it, the, the opponents seem to be saying that approach is not sufficient here and that we need to sort of, the DVD players and video game consoles are sort of a, um, a, an entirely separate category. But I wonder if you could speak to, you know, this question of, well, the, you know, are they immune? They, they certainly aren't immune from the statutory exemptions that already exist, uh, which are based on the purpose of the activity. So I wonder if you could speak to that apparent um, discrepancy. Uh, Mr. Williams. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, and I'll just say quickly, some of the comments made it sound like video game consoles can't be repaired at all ever. And that's just not true. If you take a look at our comments, you'll see that there's still warranty repair and post warranty repair available for consoles. Um, on this question of the, the limiting language that you mentioned, I mean, of course, that language is helpful to an extent and we prefer exemptions that have it, but it doesn't really solve the problem. And I think if you look back at the the records on video game consoles specifically, there's been a lot of evidence that uh, jailbreaking a console um, almost inevitably leads to piracy, that, that infringement is the number one reason to open up a console. And so just saying in an exemption that uh, it doesn't apply unless uh, as long as they no one you know intends at the time to access uh, content illegally, um, that's very difficult to police. Number one, um, and number two, there's all kinds of questions about uh, timing. So um, when you put that language in there, you know if someone makes a repair, say, um, and then a year later they start using it for infringement is that, how does that work? So the language, while helpful and while I appreciate your efforts to try to rein in some of these exemptions, it really doesn't address our overall big picture concerns that the, the 1201 statute really sets a marketplace expectation for typical consumers. And when you alter that underlying marketplace expectation, bad things tend to happen, even if uh, you've got language of that sort in the in the exemption itself. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to, Mr. Ayers, give you a chance to respond to, and then I do just in the interest of time when I move to the next topic. I I think we've had some comments on on this point uh, before, so I think we'd like to wrap it up after. Um, oh, Mr. Ayers, did you no longer? Uh, no, I'm sorry. I was just I was just uh, uh, removing my hand just in. And it's still up. <laughs> okay. It's still up. Sorry. So let's go to you, and then we'll go to the next topic. Uh, thank you, and I'll be, I'll be very brief. Just to note that, um, uh, again, limitations are better than no limitations in this context, and and certainly, if there's an inclination to to grant the the requests, uh, uh, properly bounding them is is important. But I would I would note that again. We've got uh, multiple situations where the word repair has been used uh, in in uh, in relation to activities which are arguably modifications or expanding uh, uh, the functionality of devices. Uh, also, a little bit concerned about restoring a device to its original uh, condition. Uh, does that include if the device? Uh, had a, a revoked device key because it's been uh, inappropriately used? Does that mean restoring that uh, that device with a, an unauthorized 
uh, device key that's been uh, uh, retrieved from another source. And, uh, and again, to note that the difference between other contexts and uh, the optical disk drive context here is that uh, we've already seen uh, for for years now the the proliferation of of piracy that occurs and and again noting specifically in the uh, uh, game console space that uh, uh, the most pi uh, the most uh, used uh, and popular uh, uh, platform today for modifying uh, uh, playing uh, unauthorized content is a direct result of uh, our original efforts to hack and modify the Xbox. Thank you. Um, and I, I do I see that we do have a couple of other hands up, but I, and so you can potentially incorporate uh, your answers here into the next questions. But I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Mr. Bartel, to ask about um, some other types of devices. Thanks. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I have following up on some of what um, Ms. Smith alluded to earlier about uh, questions concerning causation. Um, in the 2018 rulemaking, there were some uh, device types that in the recommendation that the office issued or the acting register issued, we had found that there was um, an ins insufficient causal link. So I wanted to probe a little bit about um, maybe what's changed since the 2018 rulemaking and see if there's an additional record supporting um, the, the, the causation as it relates um, to these devices. The, the first one I'd, I'd mention is um, uh, a category that we refer to as consumables. Um, there we found that the prohibition against circumvention was, um, it was not clear from the record whether uh, the, the prohibition against TPMs was causing adverse effects on non-infringing activities relating to replacement cartridges for um, ink, coffee, uh, litter boxes. I think we had a few other examples. I believe this came up um, primarily in um, the EFF submission. So um, I'd like to first, I guess, direct my question to Ms. Gagliano, if, whether there's an additional record in this rulemaking that you can point to that shows a causal link um, between the TPMs inhibiting repair activities as it relates to these devices that use consumables. Um, and then maybe after that, I, I can turn to you, Ms. Burke, um, and see if you have additional comments. Uh, Ms. Gagliano? Sure, yeah, if you look at our initial long form comment, I'd say that both the cat genie, cat litter box example that you mentioned and the uh, printer example uh, both go to consumables. Uh, and, you know, as opposed to last time, uh, you know, my understanding then was, was that the office was not saying so much, uh, you know, well, that's, that's not enough examples as it was, you didn't give us enough detail about what the TPMs are, whether they actually are access controls. Uh, you know, how the circumventions would work uh, and, you know, what's the full fair use analysis, statutory analysis. So this time we have given you all of that in perhaps excruciating detail. Um, so I, I think if, if you look there, you'll see, um, you know, for, for both of those examples and for printers, you know, it's not just one printer, but uh, we we discuss multiple kinds, including HP, uh, I believe, also Lexmark, and a couple others uh, that that are using TPMs, and, and we discuss in more detail what those TPMs are, how they are actually access controls, and how they they are actually uh, twelve hundred one adversely affects uh, modifications that people want to be able to make. Thank you, um, Ms. Burke. I, if, I don't, I'm not sure if your um, your comments are specific to these causation issues, but um... and as as far as to the change circumstances um, question, um, with with uh, well, first as a matter of just um, I know opposition replies to to our comments with regard to the video game console had suggested that. Um, we should be barred from bringing such a petition because it had been denied in the past. And as a matter of course, I want to point out that there are no pseudo standing kind of threshold issues 
at play with regard to this 1201 hearing. Um, it's not in the statute, it's not in the legislative intent. And so I just think as a matter of course that that's, um, you know, it's just not in, in keeping with what this hearing is about. Congress intended for these reviews to happen every three years because it understood that technology changes quickly and um, the context and circumstances of our understanding of when an exemption might be necessary could change with those times. Now, to the extent that it's um, something that the librarian would want to consider under the fifth factor of the 1201 statutory um, analysis with regard to video game consoles, there have been significant changes since the 2018 um, review. Most notably, um, one of the reasons that the video game console exemption was denied in 2018 was because of the um, availability of official repair channels. And I know that Mr. Williams had kind of gotten into this a little bit, but the, the facts there simply aren't true. Um, in 2019, Microsoft announced that it was no longer going to repair devices that it didn't have in active production. And the Xbox 360, the Xbox One, the Xbox One X um, can no longer be repaired through Microsoft. So there are no official warranty repair options or even outside of warranty repair options with regard to many of these consoles. So consumers have no choice but to either buy a completely new console or to you know, just throw it out basically. Um, then as far as like other things that have changed, I think with regard not just to video game consoles, but with regard to all devices, um, when it comes to the necessary, um, the necessity of repair, you know, over the last 13 months, our understanding of global supply chains and the availability of devices has definitely um, shown that it's much more vulnerable than we could have possibly believed before, not just um, from COVID, but you know our, our relationships with China when it comes to trade and the recent incident in the Suez Canal um, demonstrate that our ability to get devices, new devices when we need them, and to get even um, you know, official repair parts, et cetera, can be significantly challenging. And when it's, you know, when there's a crisis at hand, it's really important to be able to repair what we have, um, given some okay. of the increased concerns. Sure. Thank you, Ms. Burke. I, I do have a question for Ms. Mr. Weens that also sort of relates to this um, question of changed circumstances and um, from 2018, where the, in the recommendation, the office had found that um, for computing peripherals, I think the instance that was before us then was related to a, a hard drive um, that uh, that people were trying to access. That it wasn't actually inhibiting um, the ability to to circumvent. And, and um, I just was curious if there were any examples that you could provide relating to computing peripherals that would show that TPMs are in fact inhibiting um, access or are effectively controlling access to these types of devices. Um, the hard drive would be, of course, one example, but if you have others, um, uh, please provide those. Absolutely. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, you think back over the last three years, it's hard to think about what the world was like almost before 2020. Like so much has changed and so much has changed in this sphere. Um, yeah, I, I like to say if, if something can have software added to it, it will. And and uh, yeah, uh, the the kind of new adage is if something can have a lithium battery in it, uh, then they're going to add a battery. Uh, and so the whole world of of you know gizmos have have consumables have batteries. I'll get to the peripheral question in a second, but an, an example of a consumable that we haven't discussed before is robot vacuums. Uh, so the the iRobot vacuums have batteries in them. The batteries have a TPM that ties uh, the manufacturer, uh, you know, uh, sort of branded batteries. And if you install an aftermarket battery, the the uh, vacuum uh, won't recognize it. Uh, and that's not just the case there. I mean, we see that Apple does this with the batteries in the iPhone. Um, increasingly, uh, these battery consumables are being are being tied to the device purely to purely to monopolize sales of of aftermarket parts. Uh, just like we see in, just like we see in, in ink uh, jets. Uh, you know, it's, it's also interesting to think about like, we all, we, we do this every three years. Uh, man, it would sure be nice if this was more often than every three years because the technology world changes so quickly. Uh, I think we realized about a month after uh, the last uh, uh, <laughs> kind of hearing that as we were talking about all the things that we could repair, nobody asked for an exemption for computers, uh, for laptops. Uh, and uh, like all the, the computers and everything that we're talking to now, uh, we don't have a repair exemption for them. Uh, and 
uh, we, we're all kind of shaking our heads like, how did we how did we not think about that? And the answer is that historically, computers haven't had TPMs. Um, you know, your bog standard PC, you can get in, you can access, you can replace anything. Uh, but what we're starting to see now is, is Apple has taken the T2 security chip from iOS devices. This is maybe the thing we have to jailbreak uh, in iOS devices. And they've, they've put it on their computers. Uh, and we're seeing more secure boot um, techniques across, across the board and, and all kinds of um, um, general purpose computers. So where historically uh, there wasn't a circumvention needed to do service, uh, now overwhelmingly it is. And that's been a, a huge sea change in, in the last three years. Um, there, there have been you know, lots of other changes to areas where, uh, go ahead. Okay, no, I, I was just going to say, that I, I think we, um, I was going to give Mr. Williams an opportunity to, sure. to, um, to uh, respond. And then what we'll do it, after that is what we're going to change um, as Ms. Smith mentioned earlier, uh, we're going to uh, discuss medical devices. I believe we had a, a, some uh, comments on that, but we'll uh, focus a little bit more on that and then conclude with uh, discussing vehicles. So, Mr. Williams? Yes, thank you. I wanted to respond uh, quickly to what Ms. Burke was saying. If you, if you go to support.xbox.com, you'll see that the Xbox One S, the Xbox One X, they're still being repaired by Microsoft. And we said in our comments, their policy is to continue repairing consoles up to four years after they are no longer selling those consoles. So uh, some of what was said is inaccurate with respect to what Microsoft is currently offering with respect to console repair. Um, all of the console manufacturers also have pretty robust uh, e-recycling efforts where people can for free get their consoles uh, recycled to avoid uh, e-waste and some of the other issues that were uh, implicated there. On peripherals, I don't recall in the record seeing anyone targeting um, video game console peripherals, but you can see in some of the websites that we've provided that those peripherals are also repaired by console manufacturers uh, in warranty and, and out of warranty. Um, and so I, I, I need more specifics, I guess, to, to know the answer on any given device. Um, but my understanding is those can be repaired by the manufacturers. Um, and I don't know that circumvention is always required with respect to peripherals. Uh, I do know some peripherals can interoperate with other devices as we discussed in the disability related uh, exemption classes uh, without any need to circumvent. So I, I would need more specifics to answer that question. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Um, as I said, I, I'm going to turn now to um, some questions focused on the medical device repair. Um, for so I know we have we've spoken a little bit to this earlier, but um, maybe I could get a little bit more insight about how they're actually inhibiting access or TPMs are inhibiting access to repair devices. I think what we saw in the, in the written comments was that the opponents were saying that, that the original equipment manufacturers in this instance were providing access and servicing, servicing information as required by the FDA regulations and that that was sufficient to perform basic maintenance and repair services. Um, so I, I guess to both um, Mr. McHard and um, Mr. Kerwin, I, maybe you could both um, elaborate a little bit for us about what FDA mandated access and servicing materials that OEMs are failing to provide um, and why, why what you're receiving is maybe inadequate if TPMs are preventing access to basic um, maintenance and repair activities. Um, I guess, uh, Mr. Kerwin, I see your mic's off, so Please go ahead and then we'll turn to Mr. McHarg. Well, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, we appreciate that. Um, it would not simply be FDA that we would be speaking to. There are applicable regulations from the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Devices, particularly 42 CFR 482, which requires that hospitals maintain adequate information on equipment to have an acceptable level of safety and quality. But to speak to your point on AIAT, FDA, first, that only pertains to radiation emitting devices, such as x-ray, 
And that is, has to do with information pertaining to assembly installation. Um, and what we're seeing, and let me just back up and say that at IMERS, what we're seeing is that <clears throat> independent servicers in the secondary market may well become like the watch repair people to the extent that they're adversely impacted by this exemption. We are uh, treat rural and regional hospitals located everywhere from Eastern Appalachia and West Virginia to Kansas. And we are uh, conducting a survey of some of these hospitals and unfortunately was not able to complete it. But what we do know is that all of them are having zero capital budgets and are unable to undertake the, uh, only the basic work. And in this connection, the independent servicer whose rates are substantially lower uh, than the original equipment manufacturer is um, a preferred model. In addition, the turn time when equipment breaks down is easier. So the AIAT the, is providing assembly information um, is also something sadly with a right but no remedy. That is to say that the FDA has widely acknowledged that if there's non-compliance, there is no remedy for that. And we now see the DMCA and other federal and state causes of action being used to thwart the ability of independent and in-house diagnostic imaging services by claiming that the use of these manuals is a violation of the law. And I know there are several cases coming to trial this year. And if there's an issue, retaliation is alive and well. That is to say, many of the members are fearful that if they speak as to these issues, they'll see a slowdown of parts. They potentially will have a refusal to deal, notwithstanding that some of these same manufacturers uh, no longer own the machines, the equipment that they are selling to hospitals, group medical practices, and to some independent servicers. We have witnessed since the last hearing, a massive consolidation in diagnostic imaging with three manufacturers occupying 70% of the diagnostic imaging market with manufacturers controlling all but 9% of the servicing of equipment. Few hospitals, group purchasing arrangements and rural hospitals possess the market power to insist upon providing information to fix their own equipment. Without this information, it is difficult to conduct a root cause analysis of a problem with equipment. And as you may know, many of our members are ISO 13485 qualified and in the ecosystem of medical device care, you have many HDOs, health delivery organizations, and their well-established clinical engineers in an oversight capacity. This is not an area where fear-mongering really should have a place. And one can only look to the FDA mod reports, which are the manufacturer and user facility reports, which must be filed by the manufacturer or the hospital where an adverse event to, to look at is uh, found and you would see that under 1% adverse events have been occurring with respect to this. So the conduct in the, uh, that we're speaking of is causing a problem for those who have lawful possession uh, of the equipment and those who would service it because the price differential can be 150 to 250 an hour for an independent servicer versus six to 800 an hour for a manufacturer with uh, a minimum four hour uh, time cap. And we, so this exemption is causing adverse events. And we do feel that a new exemption needs to be undertaken. I should say this TPM. Uh, and okay. we are asking uh, to take this into account, I wish I could bring many members with me, but a number of them are just painfully worried that if they contribute to this conversation, that they could potentially suffer a loss in delayed equipment or refusal to deal in other activities. Thanks, Mr. Let's Kirkland. make sure. Oh, yes. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I do want to give um, others enough opportunity. I know we don't have a tremendous amount of time today. I do appreciate your remarks here, um, and we may be able to circle back again yet 
Um, but I just want to give uh, Mr. McHarg, as I said, a chance. And then, um, that, then I, I believe Mr. Cheney has a question and we can get to some of the other people with their hands raised. Thank you. Mr. McHarg. Thank you, Nicholas. Uh, so, so relative to uh, our ability to to seek service and manuals, uh, there has been, I would say, oh, and, and I'm sorry, Mr. McHarg, could I jump in one? I, I'm not sure if this is best directed to you too, but maybe as part of your response, could you clarify? You had just mentioned manuals, and I, I think are you seeking access not just to the computer programs, but I, I wasn't sure if there were if the um, original equipment manufacturers were claiming copyright in works besides the programs themselves, but also in like the manuals or other literary works or ancillary materials. Um, if you have any insight there, we'd appreciate it. And then um, whatever else you, you wanna comment on concerning the uh, TPMs that are preventing access. Yeah, I'd say in general, uh, we have access to manuals, manuals for the most part, but now all the manuals are digital. We're told that uh, we can access all of them uh, for a particular fee. But what we're really bumping into is the fact that we are told the, the original manufacturers, we can buy a, a service advisor, something that can help us get in, uh, potentially read the codes, read the errors. We can go and buy the parts to actually install. But the issue is once we install, we cannot get the last bit of software to have that vehicle, whether it be a tractor or a combine, recognize that new piece of equipment and actually make it functional. So in the, in the details of how this all works, again, uh, I'm not a software engineer, but what I know for sure is, is that we can get all the way to the end. And if I have a combine sitting out the field and the rain is coming and my independent repair tech comes out, installs the part, gets it up and says, well, this is, that's as far as I can go. Uh, you're gonna have to have a tech from the equipment manufacturer come out, finish that repair. And so from that aspect, that's not working for us. And to be clear, agriculture is not seeking an additional exemption uh, from the Copyright Office. We appreciate what was done in 2018, but uh, those are some of the issues we're still dealing with though, relative uh, to since 2018. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Cheney, you had a question? Yeah, we'll thank you. Oh, I appreciate it. I thank you for giving me a moment here. I, I just want to clarify uh, one thing. I don't think it was very clear from part of your question. And then I want to ask additional question. The manuals that you're talking about, in order to access those, do you have to break a TPM to get access to those manuals? And, and how is that done? Can you describe that a little bit? The other thing that I want to folks to get into a little bit here and talk about is this system of what the opponents are calling unauthorized independent providers and what that system looks like and why would hospitals and clinics and others that have these devices be having those folks on staff and what are the qualifications in order to do that? Just a little bit more detail there, I think. Um, and some of that may be, have come up in these Cal State Senate um, um, uh, hearings and some of that, uh, and so whatever's relevant from those hearings that were happening last week that may be brought in might be helpful. So uh, including like ISOs qualified and some of that kind of stuff I think you heard, I heard you mention. So I hope that's helpful for this conversation. Thank you. Okay, th thanks, Mr. Cheney. I realize I should have called on Mr. Einecker earlier and then maybe we'll go Mr. Einecker, Mr. Reed, Mr. Weens, Ms. Sheehan. Go ahead, Mr. Einecker. Oh, I believe you're still on mute. There you go. Uh, thank, thank you for that. Just a couple of quick points of clarification. So the, the TPMs would not be removed by the exemption that we are requesting. We just don't want to have the penalties associated or the consequences associated with circumventing. Basic service is defined by the OEM. It's not defined by an independent service organization. They define what you're allowed to have access to. Basic service is insufficient to, to do what we need to do to get our customers, hospitals, caregivers, uh, imaging centers, the type of service that they need to have their equipment be fully functional. Basic service is insufficient in order to do that. That's why we have to be able to go around the TPMs in order to make the equipment as functional as possible, especially when it comes to 
removing and replacing high-end pieces of equipment like glassware in imaging devices. It is essential for what, for what we do as an organization. And it's unconscionable to me as a consumer of healthcare where we can provide a service that offers a 30 to 50% reduction in cost to what an OEM is capable of doing that we're not all standing up and saying we need to have access in order to be able to do this. Thank you, Mr. Einicker. Um, Mr. Reed, I, I'm uh, not sure how much you can, if you want to continue yeah. and speaking to this, go for it. Yeah, um, so I think we heard a little bit of that old line, um, lies, damn lies, and statistics. Uh, it was interesting to say that when, um, when Mr. Kerwin said, oh, well, it's only 1%. Well, that 1%, according to the FDA's MDR review from 2017, was 40 deaths, 294 serious injury, 38,500 patients and or operators exposed to potential harm. So when one says 1%, oh, gee, it's not that many, it's actually a lot. The second part of that's important is, again, within the scope of what you're looking at, the FDA already has requirements called the Quality System Regulation, or QSR, that governs OEMs. So if you look at the uh, Section 710 of FDA's um, Reauthorization Act, we already have all of those places, uh, all of those things in effect. The specific language is quality systems help ensure that products consistently meet applicable requirements and specifications. So when Mr. Einacker says, well, we shouldn't, we should be able to reduce cost, part of what he's trying to overcome is he doesn't want to pay for or do the necessary things to meet the FDA's requirements as a QSR. So right now we fully support and think it's a great idea um, if if OEMs or others can provide service and support and meet the FDA's requirements for QSR, then that's probably a way to go for it. Right now, the third party servicers kind of don't have the same transparency or accountability and don't necessarily submit adverse reports, uh, adverse event reports in the same way that the others do. So I think that it's a little glib to say, gee, we save you 30%. But if it results in 40 deaths, 294 serious injuries, and 38,500 patients and operators exposed, then I'm not sure it's uh, something that we wave off with a hand. So I would encourage the Copyright Office to be very cautious um, for over-interpreting the, the cost reduction as something that should drive this forward, um, especially I, since the market exists. May I please respond, Mr. Reed? Mr. Reed, all of our organizations are ISO 1345 certified, the same certification as the OEMs. Your numbers, if you look at how many of the OEM organizations have caused issues with imaging equipment because of their delays and lack of responsiveness, those numbers will be a heck of a lot higher than they are for the independent service. And, and Steve, I'd be happy to go to the FDA and talk with you about some of those failures. The Copyright FDA, Office is not the, the place FDA, to have that the discussion. FDA, the FDA this is not. I'm sorry, general, gentlemen, we, for the sake the of the captioning, we actually in 2018 Speaking over each other. Service organizations provide a valuable service to the healthcare providers, and no, it's, no difference between what an OEM is doing and a. Yeah. So again, just a moment. 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 Thank you. Everyone is going to get an opportunity to speak, but we cannot have crosstalk over this, and we cannot have going back and forth without the moderator. That will not work for the court reporter. And we want to make sure everyone gets a chance to speak. So we're going to go a little bit over time because we know there's a lot of issues. We do want to cover them, but I have to ask you to respect um, my colleague who's moderating. So I, I think just to take some of the tension off of that issues, and also I think some of these issues might be going a little bit beyond. I want to make sure we're centered on the 1201 rulemaking. I think let's give Ms. Sheehan a chance to weigh in. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to respond really quickly to what Mr. Reed uh, mentioned about the FDA. And I'll say that it's possible Mr. Reed is not familiar with the FDA's 2018 study reporting on the quality, safety, and effectiveness of servicing of medical devices. In that study, the FDA issued a report which in part sought to determine how valid these concerns were about the quality of servicing provided by the original equipment manufacturers versus third-party independent entities. And the report found that the objective evidence indicates 
states that many OEMs, original equipment manufacturers, and third-party entities provide high-quality, safe, and effective servicing of medical devices, and in fact that the continued availability of third-party entities, including independent service organizations, to service and repair medical devices is critical to the functioning of the U.S. healthcare system. So just to address some of those FDA concerns that Mr. Reed raised, but moving on and refocusing on the really the core inquiry here, which is whether if, if Mr. Reed would contain his emotional responses, that would be delightful. Um, but also just, you know, this is a this is a copyright office hearing. This isn't an FDA re regulatory proceeding. And so the copyright office is concerned with whether or not there should be an exemption issued to section 1201 for the purpose of medical device repair. And I'll say again, as I said throughout this, this hearing, that repair is a non-infringing activity. The absence of an exemption to permit repair on medical devices as well as other software enabled devices causes real tangible harms in medical devices that's that's very prescient. Uh, we have people who are left without a functioning wheelchair for months at a time waiting for original equipment manufacturers to send out an, a branded repair technician. We have hospitals unable to repair rooms full of ventilators because they can't get access. Uh, they can't, they have to wait months for, for manufacturer branded repair services to come out and provide them with the special dongle, which, which is needed in order to get access to the device to do the repair or to provide the service keys. Again, another TPM that's uses to that's used to lock out hospital zone technicians as well as independent service technicians uh, and, and privileged manufacturer technicians. And as I said before, <laughs> the Federal Circuit found in Chamberlain, and this has not been returned, this has not been disputed, that 1201 doesn't give new exclusive rights to copyright holders. So that means that 1201 does not give a right to medical device manufacturers or medical device app manufacturers uh, to control the market for repair or to exclude independent repair providers. Okay, thank you, Ms. Sheehan. I, I thank you. I do have a, a question about maybe how these TPMs would work and how the, you know, if um, just hypothesizing that if the circumvent, this is maybe directed to Mr. Weens, I don't know if you have any technical um, background that you could help with, or maybe Mr. Kerwin, that um, if the, once the, the uh, TPMs would be circumvented on, on these types of devices, would the copyrighted works with the software programs or the data be, be remain on the machine afterwards? Would they need to um, be put onto another device? I'm just curious about sort of the actual mechanics of circumventing on these medical devices. I think we've heard about a lot of other devices over the years, and um, but but I'm not sure. Maybe you could provide specific examples of how circumvention works in these instances, and if it could be restored in such a way um, that it would be sort of to the original specifications. First, I'll let Mr. Weens. I see you'd have your hand raised for a little while. And maybe Mr. Kerwin, and we can maybe come back to you then after that, Mr. Reed. Sure. Uh, thanks for the question. These are relatively uh, the oftentimes, like with the wheelchair, there is a service password that you need to enter. And so, if you don't have the service password to get into additional menus, um, then then you're out of luck. So, really, the, the goal is just to bypass the password, so then you can get in. Uh, they're very common settings, like traction settings that you might want to change on a wheelchair, um, and and kind of the same thing with, with the with the ventilators and other equipment. You know, you plug the service dongle in. So no, the, the software should remain on the device. The uh, the data should remain on the device. Um, the goal isn't to uh, exfiltrate the uh, firmware from the device. It's simply to uh, you know bypass whatever check is there to see if a you know branded manufacturer representative is is, is sitting in the chair. Um, in many cases, hospital, the larger hospitals have been given these service passwords, and it's the smaller hospitals that aren't given the passwords. Um, and I'll, I'll defer to Mr. Kerwin to sort of share the situation on the ground. Thank you, Mr. I, I, Mr. Kerwin, go ahead. I, I quite agree. The, uh, the CMS has issued uh, various bulletins consistent with the uh, law cited that require you to keep the equipment in accordance with the original equipment manufacturer specifications or for certain types of non-diagnostic equipment to maintain alternative maintenance activities with a risk analysis. So that information will stay with the hospital and is expected to be there because as we know, the Joint Commission has oversight of these hospitals and is the delegated authority for many of the states. And in addition to your earlier point about, about vendor management, unauthorized independent providers um, the hospitals will undertake their own vendor management program. Some have formalized departments, some are much smaller, and they do like to see members ISO 13485 qualified, which is the ISO standard 
So the the risk is is minimal, and I also uh, affirm the other speakers' reference to the 2018 report, which I believe addresses uh, some of the concerns raised. Okay, thank you, Mr. Kerwin. Mr. Reed, I, I, um, I had a specific, well, two specific questions to you, maybe that you could, uh, and then any other um, things that you need to respond to. One was, um, to, to what extent are the existing other types of laws, the maybe the Computer, Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, HIPAA, HIPAA, FDA regulations, other existing things alleviate any sort of safety concerns here? Um, and the, the second was, I don't know how much particular insight you have as you're not directly representing one of the, um, the, the opposition comments that we had received was uh, a lot of some of the examples that were cited were seem to relate to physical issues rather than um, issues resulting from circumvention of a TPM. I was curious if you have any examples or hmm. if you don't, I can understand of yeah. instances where circumvention has led to, where, where circumvention of TPMs has led to the, the types of um, instances that you've referred to. Right. I think I think the long and the short of it is, uh, interestingly enough, I think all of this talk about the FDA and and machines comment uh, directed at me kind of points to the reality the FDA actually has structures in place to do this the right way. The Copyright Office um, and the 1201 proceeding is not the right place to do so. By the way, HIPAA doesn't apply in any of these instances. Um, just so you all understand that HIPAA actually deals with um, Portability of in electronic information. Um, it, the, the section that you might be referring to is the privacy rule, which came uh, separately. HIPAA actually only covers what are called covered entities, and covered entities are organizations that file electronic insurance claims um, or their business associates. So HIPAA doesn't uh, actually have any constraints around this. OCR, the Office of Civil Rights, doesn't have any oversight over this space um, at all, unless a covered entity is in, engaging in a practice that exposes uh, someone's PHI. So it's it's really, really separate. Um, but you hit the nail on the head. The agency that does have oversight over this is the FDA. And I'm very familiar with the 2018 report. I actually think that the work that's being done in this conference uh, on this call right now is kind of misdirected. Our efforts should really be at how do we ensure that the FDA and its quality systems regulation moves forward in a way that appropriately allows for repairs in a way that actually keeps patients safe? I'm not sure why we're talking about medical devices at a 1201 hearing, which was more around protecting people's movies and music. So I think that well, part of the problem we're running well, into is Mr. a continuum. But sorry, Reagan, did I? I bet Mr. Amor and I have the same question, which is, does that also cut the other way, which is if we're looking at whether the copyright law should um, be playing a role in this um, field, yeah, um, I, where what we're looking at perfect. is whether it's likely to be a non-infringing use. And we don't, we, we haven't really necessarily seen, I think, a reliance interest from the FDA on the copyright law for this. So, yeah, I think that's a great question. It was exactly where I was going. So you heard a little hint about it, about on the manuals part of it. The reality are the manuals are protected intellectual property. And so if breaching TPMs is a way to have access to the manual, the manual is copyrighted material. So there are some instances where um, copyright does come into play. And I do know that has been an area of significant dispute, which is access to the manuals, which is copyrighted material. So where the tools are, where the infringing tools are, I'm sorry, the tools are intended to allow access to the manual, it is intended to allow access to material that the owner of the copyright doesn't want to provide access to, and that the use would be infringing in terms of the purpose of what their product is. But I think those are kind of two separate questions. So the first question that uh, I was asked was, is this the right venue? My argument is no, FDA has these things in place, let's look there. Your second question was, are there infringing or potential infringing uses? And I would say you, you hit it earlier when, you, when we heard the discussion about manuals and access to the manuals. So I think that's, um, that's a place that is in fact in dispute and there are conflicts about access to the IP. Thank you, Mr. Well, what, what is the go, Mr. Go ahead, is, Mr. Aver. Is the is the concern about access to the manuals a copyright related concern? I mean, it doesn't seem to me that you're concerned about people getting access to the manual so they can read them in the way that 
you know, uh, you know, movie manufacturers or, or makers are worried about people seeing a movie without paying for it. I mean, I, 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 this, are, you, are you worried about people, you know, copying the, the manuals? That, well, that, yeah, that and, like a like a yes, yeah. Like a, I, I I don't want to stick up for the manual manufacturers, but what I do know is, yeah, manuals actually contain an enormous amount of very specific proprietary information. They may include information about pinouts. They may include information about access to specific information. Now, there are questions that we all have to answer about what, whether or not that limits repair, but the reality is yes, absolutely manuals contain um, information that is protected, proprietary, and in fact, again, not speaking for that industry, it's my understanding that that's part of what they provide to licensed OEM repair shops is they license access to all of that copyrighted material to enable the repairs to take place. And that's part of their license agreement with those third party repair shops. So I, I think it's considered a valuable resource to them. It's adjacent to my industry. I don't represent the, you know, they're not part of my membership, but yeah, I do know that um, they definitely license access to those repair manuals. And, and that's a key part of their um, control and income stream and uh, value for the IP that they're creating. Okay. Um, so I think we're going to go to Mr. Anaker and, uh, and Ms. Sheehan, and then um, I think we're going to um, have to move on to vehicles. Great. Thank you. And I just, I just wanted to answer uh, Mr. Bartelt's question directly. So after for medical device after TPM circumvention, the data remains on the device, the software remains intact, the device is left in its original state after the repair is complete. This is all about fair and equitable access. Uh, thank you, Ms. Sheehan. Uh, so first off, I want to say I'm, I'm kind of unaware of the circumstance where a TPM would protect access to the service manual, but in the case where it would, uh, I just wanted to address Mr. Reed's claims that that would be infringement. I would say that if the purpose is repair and the use of the manual, again, the purpose is repair, um, this is a non-infringing purpose. Also, you know, if you have a license to use the machine and the manual, you have a license to use it, to read it, to use the instructions. And then I also want to address um, just one of the fair use factors here, um, weighing in on whether that would be infringing and whether the, um, the, the use of a manual in this case would be infringing and to say that the nature of the copyrighted work in, at issue with a manual is uh, highly functional, right? So uh, copyright will protect the expressive content in that manual, but it's not gonna protect the instructions, the set of steps, the information contained within that manual. And so we're not talking here about a movie or a novel. Um, this, most service manuals are indeed a set of instructions. Um, refocusing on kind of what we're really concerned with here, which is technological protection measures that keep certified biomedical engineers that work in hospitals or that work with independent service organizations, uh, independent repair people, or people who own take-home medical devices encountering TPMs that prevent them from repairing their device. And most often we see those occurring through the, the existence of passwords or security keys that someone has to use to get into the service terminal for those devices or to authorize a replacement part or to calibrate with a new part um, or get kind of dongle-based uh, security mechanisms. And so Thank again, the manual so can I just is largely irrelevant here. We're really focused on the TPMs that are obstructing repair of the medical device itself. Thank you. Can I just stop you there? And I, I'm sorry to interrupt. I, and Mr. Kerwin, if you could, I see your hand up, and I, so I don't want to leave you out. But if you could be rel if you could be brief, and then we're going to turn to our last topic. And thanks for everybody's patience. Well, thank you. And could I just, uh, on behalf of Imers, thank you. Uh, what I was going to say is that relative to the cyber issue that was inquired about. Um, the FDA has issued its own guidances, and those of us who are participatory in the joint public-private partnership of HSCC with 600 members are working on quality and white papers. But the HHS, the Health and Human Services, is where people record in the Civil Rights Division when a cyber issue has happened. And I urge you to look to see that there's very few that are related to servicing, if any at all. So um, it's important to realize that the FDA uh, is not in the business of intellectual property. They have publicly indicated such, and it's entirely appropriate to have it here today. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Curran. Um, as Mr. Amos said, we're going to turn to our last topic, which is um, vehicles. We heard uh, briefly from Mr. McHarg and um, Mr. Rosenbaum earlier. I think we're going to, um, I have just uh, basically one, one question for each, maybe a little bit more. Um, first, Mr. McHarg, you, you had mentioned earlier that um, issues with um, access to tools um, but my question is going to be a, a little bit different. It's um, the, under the current existing exemption for vehicles, um, there's, a, there's a few different limitations. One that it, um, you know, that it not violate other laws. Um, there was a comment about needing access to vehicle user data. I am just wondering if there were, um, under the existing exemption, how repairers or user, potential users of the exemption are being inhibited from making necessary repairs, if you have examples that you could provide us, um, or what, where the existing language you would suggest be modified in order to accommodate those users. Well, I appreciate that question, and you know, I probably can't get into again to the technical side. Probably where the, you know, I, I think the need for additional repair people in our area. There's been a prolific proliferation of. Uh, expert third-party repairs uh, groups in the ag equipment sector. And so I think possibly because of the 2018 ruling, I think that is that is give uh, given credence to allowing that uh, possibility. What again has been difficult is uh, even the third-party exports experts can't get access to if I if I if I'm owner have access to say a service advisor from John Deere, they're having difficulty uh, getting access to that same that same software that I could use to repair, but yet I can infer that to uh, my expert, and they're having difficulty getting the same uh, amount of tech that say an o OEM can provide, and even if they could do that. There's still these issues relative to the, the final repair that was mentioned, whether it be the dongle or the payload that's needed. So again, I don't know if that's technically within the copyright uh, a part. I, I think there are other laws when it when it comes to EPA safety. Some of those things are probably outside this this conversation, but just from on the ground, that's kind of what's going on in the equipment uh, repair side of the equation. I don't know if I answered your question. Okay, sure, no, th thank you. I, I do see we have a few other hands raised that may be able to, um, that may be responsive to this question. So I'm gonna turn to Mr. Weens, Ms. Sheehan. I see Mr. Cheney has a question and Mr. Rosenbaum, will, I have a question for you too, we'll get back to after we go through those comments. So Mr. Weens first. Uh, sure, and and just to to share uh, the specific challenge that the the farmers are having. Uh, if if you are familiar with the case Dorman v GM, uh, the part that you get from the factory, let's say you get a new transmission or a new a, a new you know ECU, does it comes without firmware, and so you need to move your copy of the firmware from your existing ECU onto the new onto the new part. And in the ag industry, these are called payload files. The payloads are are the firmware, uh, and uh, you could the, a, a a circumvention would be taking a you know exactly what what Dorman uh, did in the, in the GM case where you basically move your copy uh, onto the new one. What what the the branded kind of the John Deere reps are doing is they're taking uh, they're downloading from John Deere's servers uh, that a copy of that firmware and loading it onto the device. So just to clarify the farm situation, um, did you? Oh oh no, I, I was just. I just wanted to see it. I was going to turn to Ms. Ms. Sheehan, but if you had one more point you wanted to make, we can do that and then. Sure, well, yeah, and, and real fast to talk about the auto industry and what's different because things have changed so much in the last three years in, in the car world. Three years ago, when we were talking about or you know, the telematics system and the infotainment system, the state was new cars were coming with Blu-ray drives, right? I, I've been looking, uh, I was looking this morning, I couldn't find a single new 2021 model year car that comes with a Blu-ray drive. I think that kind of like that has passed. Um, and instead the, the media is played from your phone. So I, I take my phone and I use Apple CarPlay or I use Android Auto. And, and so the media, any, any sort of you know, concern that we have about piracy uh, is, is centered around these, these mobile devices and not actually the car itself. Um, so media has moved off of cars and then 
in, in the other direction, all of the data that you need for repair has moved into the telematics system, has moved into telematics. And that's where you've seen the most recent Massachusetts auto right to repair bill, uh, which was introduced because of all of the problems that the mechanics are having, because the data, instead of being uh, passed to uh, the service technician via the wired port, it's coming wirelessly. And, and as we talked about three years ago, that wireless telematic system and the infotainment system on the car is one and the same. It's the same ECU. Okay, thank you, Mr. Waynes. Ms. Sheehan? I wanted to reiterate what Kyle said. So in 2018, the register passed on the opportunity to recommend an exemption for, for vehicle telematic systems. But as we're seeing, it, these telematic systems are increasingly ubiquitous. If I have a Tesla right now and I need to repair it, the, cur the current exemption from 2018 doesn't cover my repair because my repair my mechanic would need access to the telematic system in order to complete that repair. And again, as Kyle said, you know, the, the, the politics are changing around this, and we've seen a, a, a ballot initiative passed in Massachusetts with over 75% of people who are recognizing the need uh, to access these wireless telematic systems and the, and the need for their independent repair providers to be able to access those wireless telematic systems. So that's one area where we'd like to see this exemption expanded. In addition, we'd like to see the removal of the kind of duplicate liability for violating another law. So to the extent that the current language of the exemption imposes an obligation to follow other laws, we think that compounds liability in a way that really doesn't add any extra deterrent effect and is just kind of hammering on on, um, on and, and adding complexity and risk of litigation to people using the exemption. We'd be open to phrasing that in a different way that, that again, clarified that the exemption is not authorizing or making lawful any activity that violates another law. Um, but, but this compounding of liability, we think, is uh, an extra burden on exemption, on the people who benefit from the exemption that, that should be trimmed. Okay, thank you, Ms. Sheehan. I'm actually going to ask Mr. Rosenbaum about that in a second, but I wanted to turn to Mr. Cheney first as I, uh, he had his hand raised. Please go ahead, Mr. Cheney. Thank you. And my line of questions actually followed the same line of reasoning here because you brought that up originally. And so I just wanted to pivot just a little bit on what Ms. Sheehan said. And so I, and this has come up a little bit in other um, exemption discussions. In class 13, rapid seven, propose some language and there's this language has been talked about in other exceptions possibly to replace this does not vi violate any other applicable law so let me read what they proposed and this has been endorsed in that space good faith security research um, by the department of justice and others so let me read what they propose here and just sort of substitute the words in uh, in this case it says good faith security research that qualifies for the exemption under paragraph a whatever we write there may nevertheless incur liability under, under other applicable laws, including without limitation. And in this case, they uh, list Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, et cetera. So would that be acceptable modification language, Ms. Sheehan and others, both opponents and proponents in, in sort of finding a middle ground on that change? Just- I think that would absolutely be acceptable. Okay, and, and Mr. Rosenbaum, can, go can ahead, I, I think. Oh. Just ahead, a Reagan. second, Mr. Riley. Yeah, I might have been missed it, but I, I either I need to clarify for myself what was said, or we need to clarify the record. I think in 2018, the register recommended removing the limitation that excluded access to telematics and made it when it is necessary for repair. So I think I'm still a little confused as to what the proposed scope of the changes is, because it seems like some of what what you're you're saying about modern cars is already being addressed. If I'm missing something, let me Sorry, Ms. you said there's the, the 2018 exemption covers access to wireless telematic systems for the purpose of repair? That's right. We considered that and we, we granted that adjustment and removed the limitation that had been put in place in 2015. So it's broader. It was That was a change made in 2018 that is, we are, are recommending renewal for. That's fun. It just glad glad it just we're we're making progress and getting things clear. Okay, Mr. Bartelt. Sure. I, I wanted to, I, I guess uh, my question was similar to Mr. Cheney. So I was going to ask Mr. Rosenbaum about this sort of the removal of the, the language um, concerning or or modification of the language concerning um, that that the uh, exemption not violate any other applicable law and any concerns that he might have about that. And I, you may have wanted to respond to some of the other comments that were made. Please go ahead, Mr. Rizmo. 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll start with the what I call the illegality limitation, which is um, the limitation in the existing vehicle exemption that circumvention does not constitute a violation of applicable law. We would not support any relaxation of that. That is a critical uh, limitation. Uh, the 2015 record uh, was replete uh, with uh, uh, you know, information on uh, you know, automotive vehicle software, uh, you know, which controls uh, complex uh, aspects of motor vehicle performance um, and ensures that vehicles meet stringent uh, regulatory standards for safety, fuel efficiency, and emissions control. Um, you know, the Copyright Office rightly recognized this in crafting uh, the vehicle exemption in the 2015 rulemaking. Um, you know, that automotive, the automotive industry is highly regulated. Uh, and so they took into account uh, rejecting arguments that, uh, you know, these, these risks were unrelated to copyright concerns, uh, finding that these were, um, you know, uh, uh, overriding, uh, of overriding importance, uh, basing it on letters received from the EPA, uh, the Department of Transportation, and California's Air Resources Board. Um, you know, finding the illegality limitation was necessary. There's nothing in this record that would uh, mitigate anything uh, that was uh, provided in 2015. Um, expanding the exemption, you know, would risk uh, public safety and environment and, and uh, cause environmental harms potentially. Um, so, so again, we would not support any relaxation of the illegality um, limitation. Uh, our, you know, sort of getting to the you know, I don't want to get too much into telematics, um, since, as Reagan pointed out, that was that was at issue in 2018. Um, you know, you can see from our 2018 filing um, that telematics, um, you know, all again back to back to the MOU, but not just the MOU, state and federal regulate regulations. You know, going back to 2002 requires uh, requires automotive automobile manufacturers to provide uh, you know, repair and diagnostic uh, tools and information um, uh, to uh, independent repair uh, shops, uh, you know, to the extent that to the same extent as dealers, and whether that information is in telematics or not, that information needs to be uh, provided uh, to the independent repair uh, 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 shops. So it's, it's just simply not an issue. Um, and, and you know, our view here is that the existing language of the exemption does not cover third party uh, repair, commercial repair shops. And, and um, you know, to the extent uh, that there's any suggestion that there should be some affirmative language, uh, you know, that would cover them, you know, we, we would oppose that. And we uh, don't believe there's anything in this record that would support that. Um, you know, as we've said, and you can look at our filing, um, you know, again, the MOU uh, obviates any need for that sort of thing. Anyone, uh, uh, you know, uh, who needs their car repaired is able to get it repaired. There's nothing on the record suggesting otherwise. And, um, uh, and, and, and of course, the statutory framework doesn't permit it. So, um, you know, I, I don't want to get, I could go into depth on each of those things. Uh, even further, I guess, you know, one thing there was a reply, and this might be my only opportunity uh, to reply to this, there, there was a reply from the Auto Care Association on the MOU that was extremely misleading, uh, suggesting that it does not apply uh, to all users and to all uh, independent repair shops. In fact, it does. Um, uh, you know, the, under the MOU, it, uh, manufacturers make, it, make uh, the tools and information available to everyone. Uh, and, and also, um, there's a provision in the MOU requiring standardized tools, um, you know, that, so it's not, the suggestion was that um, independent repair shops are forced to buy tools from uh, the manufacturer. That is not the case. Um, and, and finally, the, the, you know, the, the issue of whether they're prohibitively expensive, which we've heard, the MOU includes provisions uh, that these tools uh, and information are provided on fair and reasonable terms. And this language goes back to, to regulatory language, you know, back to 2002. There's never been any dispute uh, brought under either, you know, regulation or the MOU 
uh, suggesting that that these were not these are not being provided on fair and reasonable terms, um, you know, and this just simply isn't the the forum to to litigate to litigate that. You know, there should be, um, you know, the MOU. There are other places, uh, you know, if if there's a dispute. Um, so so uh, with that, I, you know, I appreciate the opportunity to to uh, say my piece. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Rosenbaum, um, and you know, thank you for your patience because I understand, you know, in the roadmap, this came to the end. So, um, so we're glad you're here, and we know this is a tremendous amount of issues. We've got the benefit of your briefing. We also went a little bit over. I think this is sort of last call for comments, and people could try to keep it um, a little bit short because, uh, you know, uh, we've got a lot here. But Ms. Gagliano. Sure. So first, I wanted to share one quick point in response to what Mr. Rosenbaum was saying about the uh, safety and emissions regulations. Uh, EFF actually sent FOIA requests to the EPA and Department of Transportation, and their responses confirmed that they have never actually used 1201 or relied on it in any way to help enforce these standards. They aren't actually making use of it, which I think reinforces Michigan's point that, you know, this, it's really superfluous second layer and, you know, draw attention to the distinction. Only the Copyright Office can grant exemptions, FDA and then- Can I ask you, okay. is that response in the record? It, may, it might be, but um, have you provided that to us? I don't think that we have. Okay, thanks. Uh, but um, I can we'll see following up. And then in, in terms okay, of just you. the closing comment quickly is that, you know, on modification, which was really the focus of our uh, request, especially, you know, want to reiterate that the question is not whether there are infringing modifications that are prevented by TPMs in 1201, but that the question is whether there are non-infringing modifications that are being adversely affected and prevented by 1201. And we have shown that there are. Uh, and these include modifications that promote the creation of new copyrighted works, including new photographic works by modifying digital cameras, uh, new software works by building on what's come before. And I think the recent decision in Google versus Oracle really reinforces the importance and transformative nature of that purpose, the purpose of expanding the utility of software. Uh, so I think that is the point I want to leave you all with. Thank you. Uh, Mr. McCarm. Well, I appreciate this conversation. Unfortunately, uh, the ag uh, exemption isn't quite the same as the auto sector because we do not have a national uh, MOU. And so we, we still are constrained by uh, some necessary, a lot of necessary tools having to go back to the original uh, OEM to get, to get that service. And uh, we, we desperately need access to those third party experts uh, on, on a broad scale, because uh, again, we don't have an MOU uh, nationally that is kind of putting in place these standards, nor do we have a dispute uh, arena that we can go back and, and we can say uh, we need to be playing together in a certain uh, form or fashion. But again, thank you for allowing to be here. I appreciate the work of the office. Thank you. We appreciate you coming and bringing your perspective to Ms. Sheehan. And if, I, I, I saw you sort of nodding during the last comment. If you wanted at all to comment on, obviously, this rulemaking is limited to the anti-circumvention provision and not the anti-trafficking provision. Um, but But that was a question that just you know, sparks me about the, the ag market. Absolutely. I think I we completely agree with the office's interpretation of the statute that the, the that Congress in using the term user deliberately chose not to use the term owner. And therefore, the exemption is not limited to the owner of the device. It's to anyone who is using the device, including potentially a third party provider of repair services. Uh, and so, you know, we we fully endorse that and we uh, 
would request that their, that permission for third party assistance extend to all exempted categories. Uh, I just wanted to say a couple of things, uh, one in response to Mr. Rosenbaum and one uh, kind of wrapping up our testimony as a whole, uh, and just say that you know, Mr. Rosenbaum put a lot of weight on the existence of alternatives and the existence of you know, branded repair services, but this office has never found the existence of alternatives to sufficient to defeat an exemption where adverse impact exists. And to do so in this case would, as I've said before in this hearing, give copyright holders a new right that they don't have under the Copyright Act, that they don't have under Section 106, which is the right to control the market for repair services. And you know, we know from Chamberlain that that right does not exist. <laughs> and so um, I would argue that you know, it, it, even though there might be alternatives, in some cases, those alternatives are going to be inadequate. In some cases, they might not exist at all. But even when they are there, that itself is not determinative. And then I just want to close by, by just summing up, um, you know, whether we're talking about medical devices or, or tractors or cars or uh, software enabled litter boxes, we're essentially talking about the same functional software, the same copyright analysis, the same purpose of the use. And so in our, in our perspective, uh, the proper scope for an exemption here is an exemption for the repair of all software enabled devices. We just Thank want to you. fix that. Mr. Reams. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I one thought thing I thought uh, that I would mention is is uh, you think about how to craft this is uh, John Deere's service advisor is a subscription repair service, uh, and in the existing rec, uh, uh, rule, um, we can, you, know, you separated out uh, subscription services. I think that it was thinking of Spotify or Sirius XM or something, but. Uh, imagine the world where, uh, like OnStar, you may be paying the manufacturer for a, a repair service, and that may implicate whatever uh, decision that you make. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, and Mr. Williams, I think you're usually the last to be introduced as a W, so it's kind of fitting for you to get the last word. For one. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Just quickly, uh, on the question that's mostly been related to medical devices and, and vehicles, but, but is coming up as a general proposition of how far the office should go with respect to third party services. I just wanted to reemphasize that it's extremely important to my clients, that the office remain cognizant of that line between trafficking and um, 1201A1. Um, and so I just wanted to reiterate that. And then a couple of points that Ms. Sheehan made uh, a couple of times that I did want to respond to. One is that she said alternatives to circumvention has never been a basis to deny a proposal. That's not correct. It's, it's consistently been a basis to deny proposals. And where there are, are alternatives to circumvention, exemptions should not be granted. The other point was just that um, and I know the office staff is aware of this, but I wanted to get it on the record because it came up a few times. Uh, I believe she said that Chamberlain has never been challenged. Chamberlain is wrong. The office has said it's wrong. MDY says it's wrong. Um, Chamberlain is, is not good law at this point in my view, and we shouldn't be granting exemptions, uh, or you should not be, excuse me, based on the reasoning in Chamberlain. There is a new exclusive right. It's the right of access. It's in 1201A1, and it's a good thing. Thank you. All right, thank you, everybody. Thank you for your patience and willingness to go over as we um, help develop the, the record through this discussion. If we have, think we need anything further, we'll be issuing letters for post hearing comments, and there will also be opportunities to participate um, through ex parte um, meetings subject to transparency disclosures once we initiate that. Um, so thanks again. And then tomorrow will be our last day of hearings, which we will address um, proposed classes for jailbreaking and unlocking. Thank you. Bye-bye.